Life felt predictable but comforting in our early marriage. Melissa and I met through mutual friends and shared a desire for a simpler lifestyle. Meals together, relaxed weekends, and a future founded on love and stability. We encountered challenges, but nothing seemed too difficult. Our children added meaning to our daily lives, and I believed that our shared history would help us get through any difficult times. However, over time, cracks began to appear. We became too comfortable. Conversations shifted from dreams to logistics, and our time together became predictable. I ignored Melissa's distant expressions and changed tone. I assumed it was normal after two decades and that our bond was strong enough to withstand any change. But I was about to discover that even deep love can fade if neglected. One evening, I greeted Melissa in the kitchen, but she did not respond. I had grown accustomed to her quiet moments over the years, so I was not surprised. She came into the bedroom after washing up and asked how my day had gone. I proudly informed her of my promotion, but her lack of enthusiasm concerned me. When I inquired about her day, she dropped a bombshell. Mark, I want a divorce. I was stunned and perplexed. I didn't understand where this was coming from. When I asked why, she hesitated before confessing that I had met someone else. We need to be together. Her words struck me hard. As a skilled salesman, I was used to dealing with surprises. But this was different, significantly more personal. You've met someone. And what? Do you want a fling? I burst out, still reeling. I looked at Melissa and tried to make sense of it all. Her words did not register. It isn't like that. It all happened by chance. She explained, hesitantly. My mind was fixated on her words, but I remained silent, as if suspended in midair, waiting to crash down. Don't look at me like that, she said. I must have appeared lost, like a fish out of water. Mark, I adore him. I apologize. I never intended for this to happen, she explained before leaving the bathroom. I was overcome with emotion. But all I could think about was how there was no logic or explanation for why our marriage had ended. I should have been angry, but I was focused on figuring out how this happened. I went downstairs expecting to speak with her, but she wasn't in the kitchen and nothing was out of place. Melissa was always proud of being a great mother and housewife, and she never wanted to work outside the home. I searched the house, the garage, and even outside but she was nowhere to be found. Perhaps she is out for a walk. I thought she was clearing her mind, but as I waited, my anger grew. She had most likely fallen for someone who fueled her fantasies. I grabbed a beer and sat in the den, waiting for her return. When I awoke, it was evening, and the house was still empty. I called out for her and received no response. The house felt lonely, and I didn't enjoy the silence. Then it struck me. She'd already left. I frantically searched for my phone, dialed her number, and heard it ring. Our bedroom, her phone, credit cards, checkbook, and sealed envelope were all left behind. It felt as if her entire life had been rendered meaningless. Standing there, I realized how little it all meant anymore. I did not want to be in that room, so I left, drained and overwhelmed. I tried to sleep, but the next morning I dragged myself to work, despite feeling numb. I made it through the day without drawing attention to myself, but Melissa's words echoed in my mind. The remainder of the week was a blur of emotions. The idea of spending the weekend alone with my memories was unbearable, so I just got into the car and drove. I don't care where I end up. As I drove, I asked myself if I still wanted to be married to Melissa. I was unsure if I wanted to be with Melissa. I got married 22 years ago, not the person who had recently admitted to cheating. Despite the fact that it had only been a few days, it felt like it had happened forever. The painful reality was that she no longer wanted me, and no matter how much I hoped, I knew she'd made her choice. I found myself on a peaceful road leading to a secluded lake that Melissa and I had discovered while looking for retirement property. We never bought land there, but we loved it and returned frequently. The lake's tranquil beauty, with the sun setting over the water, once brought us peace. But now I despised it. I did not want peace. I wanted to rage. Still, I got out of the car and sat by the lake, lost in thought. As dusk fell, I was overwhelmed with memories of joy and love, and I knew I needed to leave. Walking back to the car, my emotions caught up with me. I couldn't keep them back any longer. I dropped to my knees, fists pounding the ground, screaming and cursing everyone, including Melissa. 
When the rage subsided, I was left with deep feelings of betrayal and rejection. As night fell, I discovered solace in the darkness. I am alone with my grief. I cried harder than I ever had, even more than when my sister died. Melissa had comforted me back then. Now I had no one to lean on as I grieved the end of our marriage. Reflecting on our relationship, I realized how much I adored her, not just for big moments, but also for the small ones. I told her I loved her in unexpected ways and always valued her efforts. We had some disagreements, but they never overshadowed our love until now. Her infidelity caught me off guard, and while I could blame work, I knew I'd missed the warning signs. I wondered if I was partially to blame. I should have known it was coming, but I didn't. As the sun rose, my emotions calmed. I knew the coming days and weeks would be difficult, but I was prepared to move forward. My hands were bruised and swollen, but I was determined to start getting things organized. Despite the fact that I couldn't contact a lawyer on a Saturday, I checked our finances and prepared for the worst. To my surprise, Melissa had not touched the money. It didn't fit the stories I'd heard about cheating, but it gave me a glimmer of hope. If she hadn't touched the money, she might have thought it was all a joke or a one-time fling and would eventually return. But I quickly dismissed that hope, remembering the expression on her face as she left. She was not coming back. I was left wondering why. Perhaps she trusted me not to take advantage of her and was simply waiting for the legal process to conclude. The thought of divorce remained painful, but I had no choice but to accept it. I remembered the manila envelope she left behind, but I dreaded entering the bedroom. I needed to see what was inside. Feeling like an intruder, I grabbed the envelope and quickly departed. Back in the kitchen with a beer, I stared at the envelope, curious but hesitant to open it. Instead, I checked her phone. There was nothing on it other than my phone number from Monday night. Melissa had deleted everything. I wasn't sure whether to laugh or cry. When she received her phone, she insisted on having a separate account. The bills were delivered directly to her, and I found no trace of them throughout the house. Her clothes were still in the closet, along with our children's photo albums. I couldn't understand why she left behind the items she would need to identify herself. After some thought, I set aside the mystery and opened the envelope. It included my full name. Opening it felt like the end of our life together. There were several papers inside, including a divorce petition, life insurance policies, our marriage certificate, the children's birth certificates, and the deed to the house. There was also a smaller envelope with my name written in Melissa's distinctive handwriting. I held it, dreading what it represented, but desperate to know. It took two attempts to open it. Inside was a single sheet of paper with her writing on both the front and back. I took a long drink of my beer before reading her letter. Dear Mark, I'm not sure when you'll find this letter, but you already know I left you for someone else. This was not something I intended, and I apologize for any pain I have caused. You've always trusted me. I never imagined I was capable of this, and I've struggled with guilt. You've been a wonderful husband and father, and I know this hurts, but I don't want to go into details that will aggravate the situation. I met this person by chance, and our relationship progressed beyond friendship. This is not a reflection of you. You have been everything a woman could want. But I couldn't fight my emotions anymore. Neither could they. They are all so married and have left their spouse and children to join me. If it's any comfort, we haven't had sex yet and won't until we're divorced. We didn't want to exacerbate the pain by complicating things further. I left everything behind because I am starting a new life, and dragging out the divorce in court will not help. I am not asking for anything. You've worked hard for everything you have. I hope by the time you finish reading this, I've already spoken with our children. They knew nothing, so please do not blame them. I am not asking for forgiveness. I realize I don't deserve it, but I hope our children will forgive me. I'd like to stay in touch with them, but that's up to them. Leaving you was not easy. I'm wasting 22 wonderful years with a loving man, and I feel the weight of my betrayal heavily. There were times I considered telling you. I hoped you could stop me, but it is too late now. Our emotions have taken over, and I can't change that. I hope you have a long and happy life. You may be able to find it. Please don't come after me. We'll be overseas until the divorces are finalized. I left a card with an attorney's information, Jack, Belgium. 
He has the power of attorney to handle everything. All you need to do is sign the paperwork. I hope you do not fight this. It will only exaggerate the pain. I will return after the divorce. But we will not see each other again. I haven't mentioned who I'm with to avoid causing further problems if we ever meet again. I hope it's his friends, but I'll leave it up to you. Mark, I still love you and always will. Melissa. As I finished reading Melissa's letter, my eyes welled up with tears that I couldn't stop. I had promised myself not to cry anymore, but her words brought back the pain and anger. I thought I was calm. I was too tired and in shock to feel anything other than deep emptiness. I returned everything to the envelope and left it on the table, unsure of my next steps. I knew I needed legal counsel, and it was reassuring to know that someone else could help bear this burden. Melissa avoided giving too many details, but I was good at reading between the lines. I knew I'd reread her letter several times, looking for something she hadn't said during that dreary weekend. Time dragged on. Despite her claim that she had not had sex with her lover, I found comfort in getting rid of certain items around the house. I moved the bedroom furniture to the garage and packed her clothes. Even though it was one of the most difficult things I'd ever done, I could still smell her in every piece. But I pushed through, knowing that dealing with one major setback was preferable to allowing it to consume me, little by little. The rest of the month followed the same pattern, with the exception that my attorney appeared pleased with the settlement, or lack of it. I was relieved that someone could find joy in this mess. My curiosity about the man Melissa had left with grew. I concluded he was wealthy because she did not bring anything with her, expecting to buy new things with his money. He was also well-connected, which likely helped them remain anonymous overseas. She had left her driver's license behind. I am planning to disappear. Melissa had also covered her tracks, for it to be a solo effort. I suspected she had professional assistance, but my neighbors noticed nothing unusual at the house. However, they did notice her leaving around 11.30 a.m. every day. The man also left behind a wife and young children. That, combined with his wealth, provided a starting point for my search. The wealthy are easier to track. I spoke with my attorney several times over the next few weeks, and he urged me to sign the divorce papers, fearing Melissa would return and make matters worse. I shared that fear, but I wasn't ready to sign yet. In our no-fault divorce state, everything earned during the marriage was considered community property. Melissa had stayed at home, so I could end up paying significant alimony and losing half of everything. Despite the risks, I needed to find out more about her affair before signing. Using resources at work, I identified several wealthy men in the state who met the criteria. I narrowed it down to a few options. Men in their late 30s or 40s with wives likely aged 30 to 40. It seemed unlikely, but it made sense. Now I had the difficult task of determining which wife on my list was missing, and then contacting her to explain why I needed to know. I'm not sure why I felt compelled to contact the other man's wife or soon-to-be ex-wife, it simply seemed like the right thing to do. It sounds simple, but after further investigation, I discovered that the majority of the men on my list traveled frequently for business, often spending days or weeks abroad. Which of those husbands had not returned? If Melissa's lover had returned home and then quickly left, it would have been nearly impossible to identify him. In my mind, I couldn't believe that two adults, supposedly in love and free of their spouses, could keep things platonic on such a long trip. Even with the best intentions, something would happen. A look. A touch that sparked their desire. It was simply a matter of time, which they had plenty of. It took me several more days to reduce the list to three potential men. Meanwhile, I repainted and recarpeted the master bedroom and purchased new furnishings. I hadn't moved my belongings back in yet because I was still looking for a few things to make the room feel more like mine. It's strange how things can change. When I thought my marriage was secure, the bedroom was only a place to sleep and occasionally make love. But after Melissa left, it felt gloomy. Even though I knew it was all in my head, it still had a profound impact on me. Leading up to the extreme makeover, I had spoken with my children a few times since their mother had left, and it appeared that she had told them even less than she had written in her letter to me. They asked me a variety of questions, some embarrassing, which I was unable to answer. I believe they assumed I knew more than I was saying, and I had a feeling they might have blamed me for their mother's departure. 
They didn't say anything harsh, but I sensed an unspoken accusation every time we spoke. I was relieved that my two daughters lived out of state. One had just married, and while I didn't particularly like her husband, he did treat her well. The other was a college student who would have graduated next year if they had lived closer. They would have been constantly on my case about the split, which I couldn't handle. I was already struggling at work. I was returning to a more stable emotional state. Only my boss, Herbert McNair, mentioned my previous erratic behavior and expressed concern for my well-being. I knew his main concern was whether I could still attract clients and money. I told him I could. That was the end of it. However, I noticed that some of my co-workers were looking at me with curiosity. I'd never been distant from them, and we'd had a few drinks after work together, but I kept my personal life private. I knew there were rumors going around the office, but they didn't reach me. Some co-workers inquired about my well-being since Melissa's departure, but I never brought up my marital issues. A few women at work seemed more interested in me, but that could have been my imagination. I wasn't actively looking, but a few weeks after Melissa's departure, I began to notice more women. I've never been a socialite, so I'm not very good at detecting when a woman is interested. If someone smiled at me or gave me a particular look, I usually made a quick exit, unsure whether she was just being friendly or wanted more as long as I had Melissa. I've never needed experience with other women. I also started exercising more during my marriage. I was slightly concerned about gaining weight. Not too much, but enough to justify a 20-minute workout every morning. I began running and doing a more complete workout, dedicating an hour per day to it. It helped me get rid of my anger. I also decided to improve my cooking skills. The internet is full of recipes, some of which are healthy and delicious, so my diet and cooking abilities improved. My weekday evenings became predictable. Cooking and cleaning, fixing things around the house, researching my project, bathing, and finally sleeping. Aside from the occasional phone call from family or friends, I settled into a routine free of unpleasant surprises. I suppose I needed the routine to prevent myself from unraveling. Weekends were challenging at first because I had so much free time. I remember my mother saying that idle hands are the devil's workshop. I tackled house repairs, beginning with the master bedroom. I wasn't much of a handyman and usually had Melissa call for help, but I figured I could learn. My first attempts were a disaster, but I eventually got the hang of it, and it turned out to be effective therapy. This change did not happen overnight, but rather gradually. Instead of drinking myself to sleep, I focused on my project to find Melissa's lover. Oddly, it relieved some of my pain. By the fourth month, I had settled into my routine and realized something unexpected. I despised my job. Sales requires more than just a desire to succeed. It takes tremendous motivation to keep going year after year. My main motivation was gone, but I had enough money saved to retire so I wouldn't be as comfortable. Like many others, I had dreams and ambitions that were thwarted by life's obligations. I considered writing a novel or inventing something groundbreaking, but I quickly abandoned those ideas. Instead, I considered starting a small business that sold useful items, but I wasn't sure what yet. My attorney kept pressuring me to sign the divorce papers, but I ignored him. I knew he was looking out for my best interests, but I was too preoccupied with discovering who Melissa had run off with. My daughters were less accepting of my inaction. They didn't want their parents to divorce, but they soon realized things weren't going as well as they had hoped. They treated me badly because of their own pain, not because of anything I had done. Throughout this, neither Melissa nor our children had spoken to me. I assumed her attorney kept her informed. My lawyer attempted to locate her, but her attorney, Jack Belgium, remained tight-lipped, which only strengthened my resolve. My attorney had one last option, file an alienation of affection claim. However, it was a risky move. We'd only use it if absolutely necessary, which would imply that we'd be contesting the divorce, something that both pleased and frustrated my lawyer. He'd made more money, but he was annoyed because if I signed the papers, I'd keep everything from the marriage while he'd have a victory on his record. By the sixth month, I was certain that I despised my job and seriously considered changing careers. I stuck with it because it paid well and I could use the money for future legal battles. With that in mind, I began day trading, investing only what I could afford to lose. It did not go well at first. I lost more money than I earned, but after a few weeks, I adjusted and began making small profits. 
I wasn't going to be rich, but I made enough to reinvest. I've never been a risk taker, but Melissa left, taking with her many of the reasons I'd been so cautious in life over the previous six months. After my wife left, a friend suggested I start taking karate classes. The training helped me find balance in my life, both physically and mentally, so much that I started going six days a week. I was not aiming for a black belt. I simply enjoyed the discipline and self-defense. I changed my routine to go to the gym in the morning and karate at night, getting in the best shape of my life. If I couldn't sleep, I would practice my moves for 15 or 20 minutes, which always helped me relax. I also renewed my interest in weapons. I'd learned to shoot as a paratrooper in the army, but after marrying Melissa and having children, I gave up my weapons. However, I continued to enjoy target shooting and would rent a weapon for practice. Now, with no one to object, I purchased a firearm and obtained a concealed carry permit. Though this decision was made after something unsettling occurred about two weeks after Melissa left, I began to notice things out of place around the house. I had been keeping everything in order, so seeing my keys on the rack in the wrong order drew my attention. I dismissed it at first, but then I noticed other minor changes such as a book being moved from my nightstand and a bookmark made by my daughter not sticking out as usual. These little things gave me the impression that someone had been in my house looking for something, though I wasn't certain. The thought alarmed me enough to change the locks and install a high-end alarm system and cameras. I also resumed going to the shooting range and completed NHRA home protection courses. I knew I was becoming paranoid, but being alone after so many years with Melissa was strange. My mind was a mess, and nothing made sense. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was missing something important, or that I was deluding myself due to my strong feelings for my wife. But then I wondered if I still loved her at all. Love fades, if not nurtured, and I knew I'd have to face it if I ever saw Melissa again. But I also wondered why I hadn't just accepted the divorce and moved on, especially since the terms were in my favor. Maybe my ego refused to let go. Those thoughts did not comfort me, so I pushed them away. I wasn't completely alone, however. When word spread about my separation, several female co-workers expressed interest. As I got in better shape, my interest grew. I tried a few dates, but nothing worked out. I was preoccupied with finding Melissa and was not prepared for a serious relationship. The women quickly realized this, and after one date, they usually understood that I needed closure before moving on. My search for Melissa had failed. I had three possible suspects. None fully met the criteria. So I changed tactics and tried to figure out where Melissa could have met her lover. Using a map, phone book, and the internet, I located every mall, coffee shop, and public place within a 30-minute drive of my house. The sheer number of options was overwhelming, and my resolve wavered briefly. But then I wondered, what else was there to do? I'm not an investigator, but it made sense to start asking around. Armed with the most recent photo of Melissa and printouts of three suspects, I began my search in the closest locations. Each day during lunch, I spent one to two hours visiting places and following pre-printed directions to make the most of my time. I managed to visit three places per day, but avoided weekends because Melissa was with me. In the third week, I finally got lucky. By then, I'd gotten better at asking questions and displaying photographs, approaching others with calm confidence. On a Friday, a female server at a cafe and bar recognized Melissa after looking at her photo again. She hesitated at first. She opened up after some gentle persuasion and a small sum of cash. She didn't recognize any of the men in my photos, but she did mention another man she'd seen with Melissa Gray beard glasses and neat salt and pepper hair. Although I didn't recognize the description, she confirmed that they had been seen together several times. I felt elated as I left the cafe. I finally had a solid lead that day. My mood was so good that co-workers noticed, and I even closed a difficult deal at work, earning praise and a bonus from my boss. Despite my circumstances, I felt surprisingly optimistic while using the server's description. I made a composite sketch of the man. The result appeared to be someone from a university, but I couldn't find anyone similar online. A few weeks later, I had nearly given up. I brought the sketch to work to continue my search during lunch. One day, Arturo Mendoza, a co-worker, came by and noticed the drawing on my desk. To my surprise, 
He recognized the man and explained that he was a regular donor to a charity that our company supported. Arturo couldn't recall the name right away, but he eventually remembered Conrad Miller. I was ecstatic. Sometimes it's the little things that count, and getting this name felt like a huge step forward. I considered investigating at work, but Arturo's behavior convinced me that it was best to do it at home. Surprisingly, my house had become my home again, despite Melissa's pain and memories. That evening, I quickly learned about Conrad Miller. Yes, he had a younger wife and two children, but there was no mention of any extensive travel abroad. In fact, he appeared to be a homebody. His wife, Diane Lindgren, maintained a low-key presence, which is difficult when married to a billionaire. The Internet was full of information about Conrad, a dot-com billionaire from the 1990s. He had spread his wealth by investing in everything from airlines to weapons research. I finally understood what Melissa had meant by her warning. But why would a man like that, who could date any woman, be interested in my wife? It did not make sense. Diane was stunning and Melissa, while attractive, was not on the same level. My initial excitement dissipated, leaving me confused and lost. What am I supposed to do now? I had considered becoming a billionaire rather than just a millionaire. That was a completely different world, with tight security around them at all times. Reaching out to Conrad's wife no longer seemed possible. I couldn't help wondering what Melissa had gotten us into. I went to bed feeling more depressed than ever. The rest of the week felt uncertain and apprehensive. It was as if my subconscious was attempting to prevent me from discovering the truth. The internet may be full of lies, but it is useful for gathering information. I quickly found more information about Conrad and Diane online. Conrad was wealthy, but resembled a bookish professor. Diane was gorgeous, making it even more difficult to understand why Conrad would be involved with my wife. Despite all of this, I was no closer to understanding anything. I spent several weeks researching Conrad Miller's business interests. While I am not a financial analyst, it was clear that his businesses were diverse. A third of them were publicly traded and easily researched, while the remainder were privately held and difficult to investigate. Regarding my day trading, I initially set aside $10,000, but quickly lost the majority of it. After investing another $20,000, I began to see small profits. By the time I had spent nearly $40,000, I was making more substantial gains. Six months after Melissa left, I decided to leave my job to focus on day trading and finding my wife. Despite my boss and co-workers' attempts to persuade me otherwise, I informed them that I no longer wanted to work. With Melissa gone, I had nearly $2 million in assets, of which day trading accounted for 40%. The remainder came from savings and equity in my mortgage-free home. I also had $400,000 in a 400, which I could tap if necessary, Realizing Melissa's lover was a billionaire rather than a millionaire reduced my chances of getting close to him. I changed my focus to learn more about his wife, Diane. Unfortunately, there was little information because she lived a reclusive life. There were rumors of estrangement, which was unsurprising. I learned that Conrad owned a large estate in Tuxedo, New York, where his wife and children lived, but he rarely visited. I learned all of this around the time I quit my job. Nothing was bringing me down anymore. I only needed my laptop, a few clothes, my camera, and a full tank of gas. My only concern was for my daughters, Katie and Carla, but Katie was married and living out of state, while Carlo was finishing college and preparing to begin her master's degree. They were both sources of strength for me, and I maintained constant contact with them. Carla and Katie were devastated by their mother's abandonment, particularly Carla, who was extremely close to her. Carla initially blamed me for Melissa's departure, but as weeks passed without hearing from her mother. Carla's rage shifted when she angrily declared that her mother was dead to her. I did not stop her, in a twisted manner. Melissa felt relieved that she had lost at least one of her daughters. Katie eventually began venting about her mother. It was too late when I tried to stop the negative talk. I understood their anguish. They felt just as betrayed as I did. I apologize if this story appears disjointed. My thoughts were all over the place. Divorce is similar to death, and I was going through the grieving process. I began in denial, not believing Melissa was truly gone. Then came anger and bargaining, in which I'd pray at night and promise to go to church if Melissa returned. 
Depression set in around the third week and persisted. Acceptance eluded me. I assumed it would only come after a face-to-face -face meeting with Melissa at the beginning of the seventh month. A few things jolted me back into action. First, my attorney called to see what I wanted to do about the divorce. I hadn't heard from him in months and assumed the divorce was final because I hadn't signed anything. I was surprised to learn that it wasn't. That seemed odd. The next day, Carla and Katie both called to say they had heard from their mother. Carla was a complete mess, and it took ten minutes to calm her down. When she realized it was her mother on the phone, she became enraged, telling Melissa she was dead to her and that she did not want her at her graduation or wedding. Carla even stated that Melissa would never see her future grandchildren. Melissa reportedly sobbed uncontrollably prior to the call. Disconnected. Katie's conversation with Melissa began civilly. Katie tried to find out where her mother had gone, but Melissa refused to reveal anything. Katie attempted to obtain additional information by revealing that she was aware of Melissa's relationship with Conrad Miller, as I had been open with my daughters about him. Melissa gasped and tried to deny it, but Katie had lost patience by that point. She confronted her mother, claiming Melissa had ripped out their father's heart and abandoned her daughters for her lover. Before the call ended, Melissa burst into tears, repeating her apology and her love for them. Approximately 3 a.m. The next morning, my phone rang, startling me awake. My heart raced, fearing that something had happened to my daughters. After a few tries, I said hello. Mark, I'm deeply sorry. My two girls despise me. I was pretty sure it was Melissa, so I asked, Who is this? The line went dead. I traced the number and called again, but no one answered. When I tried again later that day, the phone number was no longer in service. However, I discovered that the call came from Tuxedo, New York. Melissa appeared to have returned to the United States and was living with her lover, but this did not make sense. Conrad's estate and tuxedo were meant to be for his wife and children. Perhaps they were away, and Conrad was paying them a visit now that he was back in the country. I found out about a month ago that Diane Lindgren and her children lived on the estate. I attempted to contact her by phone, but it went nowhere. I was politely informed that she did not accept calls from strangers, as I was dealing with the ultra-rich. I realized I needed a different approach. The next day, I made a few trades and made $27,000. That night, around 11 o'clock, I went grocery shopping and was returning to my car when a man grabbed me from behind and whispered, you need to stop bothering Mr. Miller. My pent-up rage erupted. Using my self-defense skills, I twisted freely, kicked him in the knee and twisted his wrist behind his back. Who in the hell are you? I demanded holding him in a position that allowed me to easily break his arm. The man, who appeared to be in his thirties and in good shape, was clearly not a random thug. He had a professional air about him. You're making a huge mistake, he said with clenched teeth. I just felt a weapon pressed against my head. Let him go, a voice demanded. I maintained my hold and resorted to negotiation tactics. We're at a standstill, I replied quietly. You may shoot me, but I will still break your friend's arm. People will hear the gunshot, and they may apprehend you before you escape. Besides, I have a hidden microphone on me. Everything we say is being recorded, and if you shoot, Conrad Miller will face liquidation. After a pause, the man with the weapon inquired, What do you propose? Take two steps back and keep your weapon on me, I said, trying to remain calm. I will get your friend up, but he will protect me. Your job was to warn me to stay away from Mr. Miller, and I received the message. Then you will walk away, and when I feel safe, I'll let your friend go. The man agreed, explaining that they were only supposed to warn me, not hurt me. I slowly lifted his friend, who appeared enraged and dangerous. I can still paralyze you, I warned him, but let us avoid that. I instructed the other man to begin walking away. He did. However, he kept looking back. When he was about 75 feet away, I released the man I was holding and pushed him towards his friend. But instead of leaving, he turned to me and said, You have been warned. Stay away from Mr. Miller. I took out my 9mm and aimed at his head. Tell your boss that I don't give a damn about him. If he wants to keep his secret, he should leave me alone. The man paled, obviously not expecting me to be armed. I considered following them, but decided it wouldn't help. Their vehicle would not be traceable to Conrad. I needed to regroup. I knew I had stirred up something, but I wasn't sure what. I returned home with my groceries, poured a drink, and tried to calm my nerves. 
Sitting at the kitchen table, I began to compile a list of what I knew in order to plan. Conrad Miller was undoubtedly the man. Melissa took off with. But why? Diane, his wife, was attractive and appeared to be kind. Why would a billionaire prefer my wife over her? Maybe Diane wasn't as perfect as she appeared, but the media hadn't raised any concerns. It finally occurred to me that it was probably my daughter. Katie's mention of Conrad Miller and my call to Diane elicited this reaction from the billionaire. At one point, I wondered if Melissa had gone into witness protection, which would explain her abrupt departure and leaving everything behind. But if that were true, why didn't she take the girls? After tonight, I dismissed the idea. These men were not federal agents. They were excessively sloppy, and I should not have been able to overcome one of them. Even with my martial arts background, the more I considered it, the more convinced I became that these men worked for Conrad Miller. This prompted me to ask two big questions. Why was Conrad trying to keep me away from Melissa? Why did Melissa leave without discussing it with me? These questions made me think of Melissa before we met. She was 26 when we married and had previously worked as a bookkeeper. She first lived with her parents and then in her own apartment before we met. Her parents died in a house fire before we started dating, and the majority of her mementos were lost. I realized that I didn't know much about Melissa's life before we met. Then there was her cell phone. She insisted on keeping it separate from mine and the girls, despite the fact that a family plan would have been more affordable. She also had the bill sent to her directly, and I never received any of the statements. This arrangement bothered me even more after she left. Around the time I learned about Conrad Miller and that the divorce had not been finalized, I devised a plan to obtain copies of her cell phone bills. I scheduled a meeting with Melissa's divorce lawyer, pretending to discuss the final settlement. I informed him that I was skeptical and wanted to see all the paperwork first. He agreed, and I looked over everything on the conference table. I discreetly photographed the general power of attorney Melissa had given her lawyer, then informed him that I needed time to think at home. I downloaded the photos and altered the document to make it appear that I had the power of attorney. It would not stand up to close scrutiny, but I was confident it would work. When I presented it at the cell phone provider's store, they requested Melissa's password. Fortunately, I recall seeing her enter at once. It was a combination of our daughter's birth dates. I tried it and it worked. Melissa's phone was canceled shortly after she left, but I also received the last year's statements back home. I examined the statements and ruled out the majority of the calls as routine. Melissa, on the other hand, had been calling a Nashville number once a month until about four months before she left. The calls were always made on the same day and time each month. The calls then increased in the months leading up to her departure, reaching five the day before she left. I was furious to learn that Melissa had been calling her lover all along. However, Another thought quickly followed. If the affair started recently, why did she make one call per month for eight months before it allegedly began? And why did the calls occur on the same day every month? The sudden increase in calls made no sense. I tried calling the number, but it was disconnected. I had high hopes, but the phone bills proved to be another dead end. It was so frustrating that I considered just signing the divorce papers and moving on. But deep down, I knew I couldn't be at peace unless I knew why. Following my encounter in the parking lot, I realized the only lead I hadn't fully investigated was the estate in Tuxedo, New York. So I packed my car and drove 13 hours to New York. Though I only had a vague plan, I was concerned about bringing my weapon because I knew New York did not recognize my concealed carry permit. It's ironic that New York has strict weapons laws, but one of the highest liquidation rates. When I arrived in Tuxedo, I checked into a motel. I wanted to pay with cash, but they insisted on a credit card. We compromised by running my card, but agreeing not to process it unless absolutely necessary. I told them I was hiding from my wife until our divorce was finalized, and they appeared sympathetic. Next, I scouted the estate. It was massive, with a high wall around it to keep out prying eyes. The front gate was guarded, but the men were well hidden behind my camera's telephoto lens. I photographed each guard several times and noticed that one of them was the same man I had taken down in the parking lot. I knew I was in the right spot. I simply needed a way to get inside, or at least see inside. Then, two moving trucks arrived, and I became nervous. They might be about to leave, but after one of the guards spoke with the drivers, the trucks left. 
so I was confident they'd return. I was desperate to get into that house, but I am not a secret agent with special abilities. I kept thinking about ways to get inside, but each one seemed ridiculous. The estate took up an entire block, so I made several slow passes around it, avoiding the front gate by cutting through side streets. On my third pass, I noticed a large tree with a few limbs extending slightly over the wall in the northwest corner. It was an insane idea, but it was all I had. I went to a nearby hardware store and bought a collapsible ladder and some rope before returning home. When I got back, I stopped by the tree to make sure no one was around. I unloaded the ladder and rope, concealed them in the bushes, and parked my car a block away in case I needed to flee quickly. I went back to the tree, set up the ladder, and climbed in with the rope around my neck. I kicked the ladder over to avoid drawing attention. If I had to escape, I'd use the rope. Ironically, seven months ago, I would not have been able to pull myself up into that tree. But now, after all that exercise, it was easy. I climbed higher until I had a good view of the backyard. It was spacious and beautifully landscaped with a patio, an expensive grill, outdoor furniture, and a television. The main attraction was a large, oval-shaped pool with a waterfall and slide. But what really piqued my interest was Diane Lindgren lounging by the pool with a book, she appeared even more beautiful in person. Then I noticed the sliding glass door open and a man emerged. He remained in the shade of the porch for several minutes so I couldn't see who it was. Finally, he moved over to Diane and kissed her. I was shocked. It was Conrad Miller. This was a mess. He had taken my wife and was still with his own. There was a sudden commotion inside the house. Two men armed with weapons and silencers ordered the couple back inside. I had no idea what was happening, but it was obviously bad. I took out my phone and dialed 911, informing the operator there had been a shooting. I wasn't sure if there had been, but I figured it would help the cops arrive faster. I'd already tied off the rope and thrown it down. It only took me seconds to descend, and then I dashed toward the house, expecting someone to shoot me at any moment. However, no shots were fired. When I arrived, the sliding glass door was still open. I quietly entered and crept toward the voices, peering into a large living room. I saw seven people. The first four were strangers, but the other three I recognized right away. My heart sank when I noticed Melissa among them. Melissa was sitting on the couch alongside Diane and her husband. Please, Gino, Conrad begged. Let the women go. I am the one who took the money. I can get it back for you, plus more. It's no longer about money said a short, heavy-set man with a nasty smile. It is about honor. You stole from us, and that woman put my brother Johnny in prison for 20 years. I was horrified when Gino pointed his weapon at my wife, Gino. She did not do it. I did, Diane declared defiantly. I used her computer to transmit all of the information to the government. She had nothing to do with it, but she complied. All the information. Gino sneered. It does not matter. She knows too much, and I am not leaving any loose ends. Because you're going to kill us anyway, Conrad interrupted. Can I ask a couple of questions? Why not? Gino smirked. I have a few minutes. I dispatched one of my men to confirm something. What's that? Conrad asked. Gino chuckled. I was surprised that you and your bookkeeper showed up last night. We've been watching this location for weeks. We figured your wife would lead us to you. But you came back here. There must be something here that you wanted, but your wife couldn't get for you. Just then, another man entered the room. You were correct, Gino, he said, smiling. I discovered his safe hidden in the floor. Gino's smile widened as he turned to face Conrad. Your mistake was that you loved your wife too much. You could have trusted her with the combination, but it wouldn't have mattered. We intended to follow her anyway, and she would have directed us to you. Conrad sighed and looked sadly at his wife before returning his attention to Gino. But why go after Melissa? She was only a bookkeeper. Gino corrected. She was your personal bookkeeper. You treated her like a daughter rather than an employee. I assumed she knew where your money was and how to get it. I also expected her to be familiar with every property you owned and could direct us to where we could find you. But how did you find out? We informed your brother, Diane asked. You were astute in how you provided information to the government, Gino admitted. Even your husband didn't realize you were the informant at first. It took years and a lot of money for our hackers to track it down to you. I have to hand it to you. Gino chuckled. 
What are you calling yourself now, Conrad Miller? That was clever. You and your wife underwent plastic surgery and emerged as new billionaires. But most of that wealth is a facade, isn't it? It was clever because I knew you hadn't stolen a billion dollars. What did you take? Forty or fifty million? Seventy-eight million? Conrad made a correction. Is it that much? Gino nodded. I am impressed. But you've always been the smart one, Jacob. That is why my brother brought you in. You converted our illegal money into legitimate businesses. But you became greedy and skimmed too much. We had no idea where it was hidden. Johnny eventually caught on, and he was about to kill you when your wife turned him into the feds. It threw me off for a while, but I eventually located your bookkeeper. I intended to kidnap her and her family, torturing and killing them one by one until she gave you up. But then she vanished without trace. That's when I realized there was a mole in my organization. It didn't take long to realize it was Kelly, and we eliminated her. Kelly is dead, Conrad inquired, shocked and saddened. Yes, but I did not eliminate her. She jumped out of a second-story window in an attempt to escape. Unfortunately, she died on impact, so we received no information from her after she bolted. It made no sense to take her family without knowing where she was. We tapped their phones. It took months, but we eventually discovered your real name and the location. If you knew we were here, why didn't you take us last night? Conrad asked. Gino shakes his head. I outwitted myself while watching this house. I assumed you'd need new IDs, so I prevented them from being delivered. My intention was to replace the moving van drivers with my men, but when you did not receive the new IDs, you sent the vans away. That's when I resolved to strike. Now here we are. That's enough talk. You can make it easy or difficult. I need the combination to the safe. If you don't give it to me, I'll eliminate your bookkeeper first, followed by your wife. Finally, you. Worst case scenario, I'll simply cut open the safe. Everything clicked while I stood just out of sight. I had one option. Gino, Conrad snarled. I used to think your brother was the lowest prick. But you have proven me wrong. I'll take it as a compliment. Gino laughed. But don't worry. I'll send your regards to Johnny. Let's finish this now. Months of rage, depression, and despair faded away. I was still scared, but I knew I needed to act. I quickly reviewed my firearms training, checked my Ruger's safety, and aimed at Gino. My instructor had taught me to address the most immediate threat first. I knew I had just seconds to make each shot count. I took a shallow breath and squeezed the trigger. I knocked Gino in the back and he fell forward. I then shot the man aiming at Melissa, knocking him down. I fired again, striking a third man before they returned fire. A bullet struck my left side, but I continued shooting. The fourth and fifth men were killed, but I was shot again, and a bullet slammed into my left shoulder. Blood was running down my face, most likely from a graze on my forehead. I stood there, staring at Melissa and unable to speak. Her eyes widened and she approached me. I recall hearing the sirens of police cars before everything went dark. When I awoke, I realized I was in a hospital and remembered everything. It was dark, and the room was packed with medical equipment. I noticed I was handcuffed to the bed while in pain. I pressed the nurse call button. Melissa surprised me by entering the room with a police officer. Mark, she said in a panicked tone. Are you okay? I'm just hurt. I responded weakly. I was hoping someone would give me something to relieve the pain. A nurse arrived moments later, holding a syringe and administered the pain medication. The pain began to subside. Melissa moved to my side and the police officer stood at the foot of my bed. Oh, Mark, Melissa cried. I'm very sorry for putting you through this. I wasn't sure what else to do. I knew what Johnny and Gino were capable of, and I was terrified of what they would do to you and the girls. I wanted to protect you all. Conrad persuaded me that the only way to keep you safe was to make you believe I had a lover and divorced you. I nearly crumbled when I saw the pain in your eyes. Melissa sobbed harder. I reached out to take her hand. You did this to protect us. Yes, it hurt a lot. I spent months trying to understand why you abandoned us. I needed to know why, and I apologize. I believe I directed Gino and his men to you and Conrad. No, Mark. It was not your fault. Melissa choked between sobs. It's entirely my fault. I called each of you because I was lonely and missing my family. Even though Conrad had warned me not to, I found out how much the girls despised me. I wanted to die. But I couldn't tell you where I was or what was going on. 
Conrad was desperately trying to get us new identities and a new hiding place. The moving trucks arrived, but we still didn't have our identification. I'd resigned myself to being eliminated, but at least my family was safe. My pain medication kicked in, and I lost track of time. When I woke up, the sun was shining. Melissa was asleep in the chair beside my bed, holding my hand. My arm was bandaged and ached, but my side hurt worse. Still, the pain wasn't too severe, so I attempted to pull myself up in bed. If you've ever spent time in a hospital bed, you know how uncomfortable it is. In addition, being handcuffed to the bed makes it difficult to move around. Melissa awoke with alarm in her eyes as I attempted to sit up. What are you doing now? She asked. I responded with a weak smile, attempting to relax. She adjusted my position until I was more comfortable, then surprised me with a kiss. I never imagined I'd feel her lips against mine again. I love you with all my heart, she whispered. Will you ever forgive me, Melissa? It's clear that I still love you, I said. I considered signing the divorce papers, but after 22 years of marriage, I couldn't do so without understanding why. I suspected you had a lover, but it didn't make sense. I couldn't give up until I knew you didn't love me anymore. Oh, God, what have I ever done to deserve you, she said, crying again. After she calmed down, I instructed her to take the key to my motel room and rest. She appeared exhausted, so I persisted. Persuading the police officer on duty to let her have my motel key was another challenge, but a call to his superiors eventually worked. I then learned that the district attorney was debating whether to charge me with possessing an illegal weapon. It's ridiculous, considering I just helped bring down a major criminal organization and they were concerned about a concealed carry permit. After Melissa left, I asked the nurse to get my cell phone, but it had been taken by the police. They eventually allowed me to use the hospital phone, and I called both of my daughters, Katie and Carla, and told them the entire story, leaving out the fact that I was in the hospital until the end. They were upset and insisted on seeing me. Both girls were devastated when they learned what their mother had gone through and regretted how they had treated her. I told them not to beat themselves up. If I had the chance, I would have said something worse. Katie arrived at the hospital ten hours later, having flown to LaGuardia and rented a car. She appeared pale as she entered my room and Melissa had gone out for coffee. Oh, Daddy, are you going to be okay? She asked, hugging me softly. The doctors say I will be fine. I assured her that they would release me tomorrow. By then, the DA. We chose not to press charges, but we agreed to be available if they needed us to testify. Melissa returned a few minutes later. I hadn't informed her that the girls were coming. She was afraid of running away again after what they had said to her when she saw Katie. They exchanged a brief stare before Katie dashed over to her mother and they hugged, crying and apologizing. Carla arrived four hours later and the scene repeated. Soon all three women were gathered around my bed, fussing over me. Finally, the nurse got me up to walk around and my wife and daughters refused to leave me alone. Tears filled my eyes. It took more than six months, but my marriage had recovered from the brink of disaster to become stronger and more loving than ever. In the weeks following the shootout, I learned that Gino and two of his men had died on the scene. The other two survived surgery and are now facing liquidation and hijacking charges, which will likely land them in prison for the rest of their lives. Gino's brother Johnny was also charged with liquidation, and all three of Conrad's guards died. Fortunately, neither my nor Melissa's names were released to the media, despite the FBI's assurances that the criminal organization was destroyed. I insisted on having our names redacted and obtained a court order sealing the records. Conrad and Diane turned state evidence, revealing parts of the criminal network that the feds had not discovered. They were sentenced to community service in exchange for turning over their illegally obtained wealth the majority of which was in bitcoins locked in the safe. They must have had valuable information to receive such a lenient sentence. I also found out that their two children were staying with a nanny in Florida after completing their community service. Conrad and Diane left the United States, most likely without handing over all of their money. A year later, we received a postcard from Spain that simply stated, we apologize for everything. Thank you. Melissa's return home required some adjustment. Despite the fact that I understood why she left, I still felt resentment toward her. 
Meanwhile, Melissa suffered from night terrors and woke up screaming. We found counseling to be extremely beneficial. Melissa was caught off guard when she returned home. The house had changed dramatically while she was gone. I'd finished all of the repairs, repainted, and completely redone our bedroom. Melissa also had to adjust to my new job. I no longer wanted a traditional job and now work from home on day trades, allowing us to take spontaneous vacations together, which she enjoys. She was impressed with how fit I'd gotten and began going to the gym with me. She wasn't particularly interested in karate. We now go to the gym three times per week, and I practice karate twice a week. Our sex life was reignited with renewed vigor as we both realized we couldn't take anything for granted. Carla is getting married in three months, and Melissa is very involved in the wedding planning. Katie is pregnant with a boy, and both girls call us almost every day. Carla even moved in for a few weeks after I returned home to assist. But I felt relieved when she returned to her apartment. I did not need another wife. Melissa and I are still very worried about each other. We started sleeping together again. I'd wake up when she called to check if I was still there, and I'd do the same. At the start of it all, I was desperate to figure out why she had abandoned me. Here is the next story. I had just come downstairs from a post-work shower when the doorbell rang. It was early summer, around 7 p.m., and the soft dusk light did not yet necessitate the lighting of street lamps. Honey, my wife called from the kitchen. Can you get that? I'm about to finish the risotto. I grinned. I love her black truffle risotto. Jenny was always a good cook, but her signature dish was risotto, which she perfected over the course of their 20-year marriage. In many ways, the risotto represented our relationship, hearty and reliable, tweaked and fine-tuned in, small adjustments over time to achieve perfect balance and enjoy tremendously. I get it. I called out and approached the door. The first floor's open windows let in warm air with a baked, lazy scent of pollen and grass. I opened the door to find a woman of indeterminate build standing there. She appeared to be about five feet five, with dark hair pulled back from her sunburned face into a ponytail that hung well past her shoulder. This made it difficult to determine her age. She could be in her late thirties or early fifties, but she could also have been much younger. Her dark eyes were small with easy crow's feet around the corners. Her nose was broad but not prominent, and she had full sensual lips. I suppose she was from Central or South America. Based on her features, she was or had been beautiful at some point. Her clothes appeared to be a simple linen blouse with loose-fitting trousers. She was wearing sandals, taking it all in at a glance. I noticed she had what appeared to be a very expensive pedicure. That seemed out of character with the rest of her simple, unadorned appearance. Can I help you? I asked. She gave an easy smile that reached her eyes. They darted and cast playful glances at me, implying she was keeping a secret. Mischievous came to mind, so I adjusted her age down, possibly making her much younger. When she adjusted her posture, I was struck by how her simple clothing clung to her body. There were implied plush curves underneath. Mr. Reinhardt, Carl Reinhardt. Her smile revealed white, uniform teeth. Her voice was rich and accented, but not in the Latino way I expected. It was more guttural and harsh. I couldn't identify her native language, but it wasn't English. Yes. Can I help you? I repeated. Welcome, Mr. Reinhardt. My name is... And it was the oddest thing. When she told me her name, it was as if I didn't understand. Perhaps it was her unusual chappy accent. Perhaps I was tired. But at that moment, a breeze blew through the doorframe, carrying a rotten, sour odor with it, and it distracted me, if only for a moment. But you can call me Sally, she proceeded. She extended her hand in a fluid, graceful gesture. Out of habit, I responded again. I was expecting a working woman's hand, but was surprised. The hand was delicate, with long, slender fingers, but the grip was not delicate. It was dry, but surprisingly strong. Her hands were also adorned with a well-maintained and most likely expensive manicure. Mr. Reinhardt, my reason for seeing you today is a serious matter involving you and your wife. Is she here? She continued to shake my hand as she spoke, eventually releasing it. I found the extended contact strangely exciting. I'm here. She is here, but she is making dinner. I turned back towards the kitchen. Can. This way, we are just about to eat. Can you come back? Perhaps a little later. 
The dancing, laughing eyes twinkled. When I asked Mr. Reinhardt, I had an odd feeling I already knew the answer. I'm afraid this is an important matter that has a significant impact on you, and I believe my timing is perfect. The smile, I just stared. Mr. Reinhardt, there is filth in this house. I am here to perform a cleansing. I looked behind me, looking for the stain she was speaking of. I could not see anything like that. Among her many talents, Jane kept a clean house. I returned my gaze to Sally, or more specifically, where she had been. She had somehow gotten past me and was now standing just inside the door threshold. I wondered how she had gotten past me without my knowledge. I'm a big guy and took up a lot of the open door frame, but apparently not enough to keep her on the front doorstep. I apologize. You're cleaning, woman. A service? I asked, adjusting myself sideways so as not to touch her. Something told me this would be a bad thing. She shook her head, giving me a quick glance with that coy smile. I didn't need to be a body language expert to recognize the look. However, I was too slow to understand. I was mildly offended. Oh, would you please come in, Mrs. Sally? Thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. Honestly, the more she spoke, the more I noticed an almost musical sing-song quality to her voice. It was enchanting, and I felt compelled to listen to her. Carl, Carl, she echoed, her laughing eyes amused by my puzzlement. Jen and I attempted to have an honest sit-down meal at least twice a week. Modern living has made it all too easy to fall into the trap of disposable time, takeout, or informal meals eaten straight from the stovetop. Junk food for spending time together. These meals provided no opportunity for communication or bonding. How many opportunities for good conversations were lost in this manner? So we decided to try and commit to spending real time together. We were not perfect at it. We were not obedient to the ritual. But if we had the opportunity, if we were both at home and had a clear schedule, why not spend an extra 30 minutes getting to know your partner better? Our daughter Angie was still away at school, finishing her freshman year at the State University. When she was home, we tried to be much more consistent with mealtime with the kids, despite their busy schedules. Dinner was about the only time we could get our daughter to sit down and talk to us. Jen and I tried to maintain the habit while she was gone. The risotto was the ideal excuse for such a sit-down meal. Hun, is the table set? Jen called from the kitchen. Yes, I called back. I considered getting a third place setting for the table. Okay, it's ready. Jen wheeled around from the kitchen into the dining area, carrying the serving dish. She moved to set the steaming dish down on the table. The rich, earthy aroma of the food filled my nostrils. I hadn't realized how hungry I was. Who was that? Oh, she said, noticing Sally standing beside me. Jen's eyes widened before moving to mine in a silent WTF. If I had paid attention to the first look, I might have asked more questions. It would not have changed anything, however. Really? Hun, who is this? Her voice was low and soft, but with a hint of menace. A cornered cat will let out a low, gurgling moan that signals an impending attack. I couldn't help but think Jen had just demonstrated the human equivalent of a fight-or-flight reaction. Jen, this is his only opportunity to properly address my wife and her. She paused. I couldn't explain it, but the air in the room had changed. It throbbed, and the source was centered on Sally, as if she had grown much larger than the woman I had just met at our front door. Jennifer Reinhardt. I am. Again, there was the staccato whisper. His tongue touched the palate and teeth. His rough consonants were invoked, and once more Sally's true name escaped my ears. The delicious aroma of my wife's hearty cooking was replaced by the sickly sweet odor of decay and rot, which corrupted the tranquility of our home. It transformed something wonderful into something sour, and I swooned, my hunger replaced by a brief nausea. You've sinned against your husband, and you need to confess to make amends. Jennifer appeared both ashen and furious. Her mouth worked like a goldfish, gulping air in great quantities. It was rare to see my wife at a loss for words, but this swarthy dynamo had usurped and upstaged her in her own home, seizing control. My surprise at seeing Jen in such a state subsided, but the entire scene was so bizarre that I was more affected by the impact of Sally's words on Jen than by what she had actually said. Jen had understood right away, of course, but I was a little slower. I did catch up, though, and that's when I noticed the room tilting as if I was losing my balance. The pit of my stomach dropped. 
Then it was my turn to open and close my mouth like a hungry goldfish. That was certainly something. If I had to describe Jen, I would say self-assured and confident, and then go from there. It was one of the things that drew me to her when we met in school. I was a chemistry graduate student who fell for one of the students in my introduction to chemistry course. She was a tall, athletic blonde with an abundance of good Scandinavian genes. She was not the most attractive woman in the class, but she had girl-next-door looks and a warm personality that made people remember her. My courtship with her had to wait until after my course with her was completed, and even then, I had to compete with a slew of other competitors for her attention, such as her full course load and extracurricular activities. She even participated in student government and tutored on her own. I reasoned that I couldn't be jealous of the schoolwork, only of the guys. It was a completely different challenge. There were frat boys, jocks, and a variety of others vying for Jennifer Horn's attention. I was neither the most handsome nor the richest, not even close, but I had other tools to use. I was particularly inexperienced. Say whatever you want about stereotypes. They exist for a reason. Young men are notoriously bad at reading social cues, particularly those of women during the courtship dance, throughout my university years. I'll do more than just reinforce that tired stereotype. That period in my life was a time of significant personal development for me. I realized that I would put up with a lot for this woman. I had to reach deep within myself to approach her after a session in order to plant the seed. A breathtaking demonstration of bravery. I had never thought it was possible before. I surprised myself by choosing to be vulnerable and risk rejection. And then I had to preface everything by explaining that I couldn't date her while she was in my class. So my initial contacts were just placeholders for later. Talk about planning ahead. When I was finally able to meet with Jen socially and carve out some time from her hectic schedule, I tried to stay positive and focused on us. Our time together lasted only hours. I didn't discuss the things I couldn't control. I was a lot of things, but I wasn't going to win. Besides, what good would it do if I complained about it and became a worse person around her? She could simply replace me by refusing my calls and moving on. And then, where would I be? No, I had to be the bigger man and allow the real me to shine through. I had to bite the bullet and concentrate on the bright side. I wasn't without pride, but it came at a cost. But for Jen, I gladly paid it. But I couldn't help but feel her pain when she turned down a date to attend an invitation-only fraternity mixer or travel with one of the university's sports teams to play a game on a rival's campus. I mean, I knew she was a popular girl, and we weren't in a committed relationship so she could do whatever she wanted. During that time, I had to watch from the sidelines as she sampled and enjoyed the benefits that an attractive young woman often believes she is entitled to. She was not in a committed, monogamous relationship and was determined to satisfy her desires outside in public. She was in command and content, but every now and then there was a gleam in her eye. Jen wasn't lying, so I asked what she was up to. I was pretty sure she would have told me, and if I had asked for more information, I'm sure it would have been fine. But she mostly avoided talking about what she did when I wasn't around, which was fine with me. What I gained from pushing is not much. I chose to keep my peace of mind. However, as I previously stated, it is dumb. I came from the proverbial small town in the United States, where I was smart, but not exceptional. I was big-boned, strong, and fairly attractive, but I was never going to be anything more than a weakened athlete. I dated a little. Getting out of town to college was preferable. The competition was fiercer, but the talent pool was significantly larger. So, after much trial and error, I lost my V-card and became a man. I made my way through undergraduate classes, but never connected with one that was satisfactory. I knew there was somebody out there for me. I wasn't in a hurry to reach the finish line. I'd made enough mistakes and was convinced that I didn't want to make the same ones again. When I started graduate school, I focused on organic chemistry and really enjoyed it. As fate would have it, I was led to her. We ran in different social circles, so our paths did not cross until she enrolled in my TOS seminar. She left an impression on me. At the very least, I didn't pick favorites, so it wasn't like I was some sap who pined for her during the session. But she was smart and engaged in the lessons, so I was able to lay the groundwork for future contact. I'd never had a relationship develop from those roots before. Again, this appeared to have faded. As I previously stated, I had never noticed her prior to that class, but afterward, I saw her everywhere. 
She was my personal batter, main phenomenon. We'd run into each other outside of class and exchange a knowing nod or smile. After the course, she received a well-deserved B. We kept bumping into each other and laughing about how we were stalking each other. We both knew she was the more attractive of the two, so it was likely that I was stalking her, but I wasn't. The world might be a strange place. And who said synchronicity didn't exist? I finally had a spine and gave her my number. She took it in her usual easygoing manner. After the required three days, I received a call asking if I was available to meet for coffee with her. Of course, always. We felt at ease when we finally fell asleep together. Don't get me wrong, I was glad we both were. But it wasn't as if the earth shifted and time stopped. I believe we were both mature enough to see it as two young people enjoying their bodies and having fun. Not much more than that. We made no further commitments. But I was glad to be with her while she was doing that. I learned about my own desires and how to suppress a need for immediate gratification, as well as the crippling inferiority I felt inside as she openly flirted, teased, and played the field. I remained true to her. I have always been a one-woman man. I understand how that sounds. I felt like a fool pining for a girl who was out of my league. Maybe it wasn't far off, but I was going to play it out while I still had the chance. My persistence and determination had won her over. When others refused or couldn't meet her demands, she simply moved on. She made it clear to her dates that she had plenty of companionship options, and if they refused to meet her needs on her terms, she'd move on to the next one. Who? I stayed in a place of stability. It didn't hurt that I was a little older and more committed to my career. I'd like to think she appreciated the sober and mature balance I brought into her life. Of course, some guys were content with adding gin as a notch to their bedpost. I can see why she was worth it. She was aggressive in bed, and her strong, lush body resembled a fertility goddess. I stayed the course and continued. The others eventually fell by the wayside, leaving me with only one. We continued dating, and around the time he graduated, I proposed and we married. We converted our house into a home with a backyard garden shortly after purchasing it. I had to admit it was my pride. Over the years, I'd developed a green thumb and transformed the space into a haven from the rest of the world. Guests always commented that it was our own Eden. I suppose we stayed in the same house for so long because I didn't want to uproot my garden and start over. Jen began her career as a teacher, but Angela was very eager to join. An early oops baby. After a year on the job, Jen decided to become a stay-at-home mom, at least until Angela started secondary school. Jen resumed her teaching duties as if nothing had happened. It wasn't like she needed to work. She didn't know any other way. She was simply a motivated woman. That was my Jen. Over the years, she participated in school activities such as class trips and club oversight, as well as several neighborhood groups. She was the real deal, a stunning, intelligent, and vibrant woman who adored me and our daughter Jen. Silence was short-lived. She clearly sees that in our guest. Her voice was low and quiet, squeezed through clenched jaws and teeth. Carl, what? What's she doing here? There was something going on here that I missed. Hell, there was clearly a lot I missed. As I previously stated, I may be completely clueless, but something else was going on between these two. The tension in the room was palpable. Jen appeared to be several inches taller. She was a couple dozen pounds heavier and furious as a result of being accused. If my memory of the last decade is correct, someone was cheating on me. I half expected her to throw herself at her accuser at any moment. Zali, for her part, did not give an inch. She stood her ground, fearless and prepared to build a cat. Both Zali and I were staring at my wife, Carl. Her strained voice drew me back, spurring me into action. Honey, this is Allie, and I thought she was here as part of a maid service to clean the house, but I clearly misunderstood. I was still staring at Jen. I believe that focus was the only thing that kept me from collapsing to the floor in the heat and crying like a child. Zali turned to face me, seizing the initiative yet again. Carl, Reinhardt, I've been welcomed into your home. Will you give me my due as a guest? Wasn't she full of surprises? She was correct. Mom and Dad have died, but they had instilled in me the rules of hospitality. Carl. The tension in Jen's voice alone was a warning that I should not even consider hosting this disruption. As an aside, someone from the outside may believe that I was severely henpecked and that Jen ran all over me. That makes sense to me. 
Those who believe this, on the other hand, are looking in from the outside. Our life together was far more equal and balanced than my actions might have suggested. To be honest, I believe we were a pair, always aligned. We were a strong couple because we had so many common interests, and when we disagreed, Jen could express her point of view in a way that I could understand. I may not always agree with her views or actions, but I can understand them. And up until that point, I often agreed with her because her happiness was important to me. And there were so few life choices available to us at the time that what I desired far outweighed the peace I chose to keep and maintain. Simply put, she made some decisions, and I decided to accept them. It worked well for us, but others outside of our pairing might have had questions. Allow them to talk. I knew what I knew, and we were happy. But this was one of the rare occasions when I felt this way. None of what she was proposing. Jennifer. With our gazes locked, I spoke in a low, serious tone. I almost never used her full name. That struck me as significant. Something serious is happening here. Extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. Isn't that how the saying goes? I felt like I was at a crossroads with no clear path to take. This evening was going to be a huge change in my life. And our lives. You can't believe this. Frankly, I'm not sure what to believe. I interrupted Jen's speech about it again. She wasn't used to me taking the initiative against her wishes, and I won't know what to believe until I hear what our guest has to say. I'm obviously not pleased with this accusation. So there. Jen, I'd like to hear an explanation from both of you about the change in the room. She didn't really relax, though. She did de-escalate. Good. Where are my manners, Sally? We are just about to eat. Would you like to join us? You clearly have something to say. My mouth was dry, and my knees couldn't support my weight, so I needed to get off my feet before I collapsed. I turned to see Allie smiling, her eyes crinkled. There was a lot to that simple gesture. She nodded, her chin dipped slightly. Thank you, Carl. We will need to talk first. This must be finished. The food will last until we are ready. Okay. It was her show. We do things her way. I nodded and pointed to the living room set. The earthy aroma of the meal reappeared in full force. I hope they can eat. Zoe's accusation did more than upset my stomach. Jen's dissatisfaction with me was expressed in an exhale, hiss as she rose to her full height. This is nonsense, she muttered, but followed us into the living room to talk. I offered Zalia a chair, but she politely declined. Instead, she gestured for Jen and me to sit together on the love seat. I wasn't feeling like I wanted to be that close to Jen for a variety of reasons. Please entertain me, our guest inquired. I sat as far on one side as possible. Jen refused completely, arms crossed, feet tapping. Her gaze shifted back and forth between us. I noticed that something unspoken but profound was exchanged between the two. Damn it, I am clueless. Sally was unconcerned about Jen's temper and gestured toward the coffee table. May I? I nodded, and she slid it out of the way, leaving more marks on the carpet. She motioned for Jen to take a seat beside me. To say I was conflicted is an understatement. The pit in my stomach gaped and threatened to swallow everything. I swooned as I sat, the recent events racing through my mind. You are not going to do anything. My wife sighed and glared at me. Will you just sit there and let her do this? Which kind of man are you? I was used to her attempting to impose her will upon me. I'd always chalked it up to her personality and the cost of maintaining the peace in our relationship. But as she railed at me, as my guts rebelled, and as I tried to process how my world was slipping away, I realized that there would be no peace in our relationship, at least not any time soon, that if what I imagined was about to happen, the pieces were on the table. The game was set. It had to play out. Our eyes met from ten feet away. She leaned in and sneered at me. I can't believe you'd go there and sit down. Jen recoiled as if I'd slapped her. In a way, maybe I did. As I previously stated, Jen is a big girl. I'm still quite a bit bigger. And despite my tendency to be passive, I knew I could be intimidating in my own way if my words failed. Another pause. Spare me your self-righteous indignation and sit down now, I said at a much lower volume. I felt heat rising in my ears. I knew this was a sign that, despite my outward calm, a real anger was rising within me. 
and if Jen wanted to push it, she chose not to and sat as far away from me as possible, shooting glares and muttering a string of curses under her breath. If looks could kill, local homicide would be cleaning up Zali and me with a wet vac. Zali watches the entire exchange in silence, seemingly pleased with herself. Once we arrived, Zali addressed me. Mr. Reinhardt Tal, thank you for your hospitality. I understand the disruption to your evening routine, but this is an issue that must be addressed if you two are to continue your marriage. This affects not only you, but several people outside of your marriage. My thoughts turned to Angie, my family, her parents, and Jen's sister. This would affect all of them. Thinking about our family, soften the mayonnaise, it will be painful. I apologize. This must be revealed, however. And when it does and we're done, certain decisions must be made. Only then can we move forwards. I thought it was the understatement of the day. Zali turned to face Jen. I need you to tell me about the first time you cheated on your husband. Jen's rage came out in waves. You perverted woman. Wait, I interrupted. Who were you in this? I still don't know who you are. She smiled without threat or guile. Yes, who am I? Honestly, I could tell you everything. We do not need her to tell us anything. However, telling you about your wife's infidelity would carry little weight. I have all of the information and can provide you with facts, dates, poos, and weights. But why? Believe me, those are your wife's confessions, not mine, as you have your own. We do not need your wife here, but we need to get past this. Then she needs to tell her own story. Are you some type of private investigator? I asked, because I wasn't getting it. How do you know that? I am the reason she cheated. She spoke while looking at Jen. My wife growled next to me, but only hung her head before sobbing quietly. Randall Higgs and Jen had a spat. The name didn't mean anything to me. I'm not sure if that made me feel better or worse. Was it a good thing that my wife's lover's name was meaningless to me? Who? He was a trainer at my gym after attempting to lose baby weight after Angie was born. Oh, how cliched. Zali crossed her arms and shook her head. The first time that pulsing occurred, it was the damnedest thing. She never moved, but she exuded a power that permeated the entire room, and with it came the nauseating stench. You goddamn bitch! Jen appeared ill, but her anger was strong enough to tear Zali apart. Her fists were balled in the skin, white and bloodless from the intense squeezing. I wasn't sure why she didn't act on it. Zali appeared pained, but persisted. I can't help you unless you're being honest with yourself. I still didn't understand what was going on here. Jen's head dropped again. She sobbed quietly as she tried to keep it together, but it was a losing battle. I wanted to comfort my distressed wife until I remembered why she was crying. What she was confessing was all of her adultery and her refusal to deliver on me. She spoke again, barely above a whisper. Jerry. Rainey had sex with Jerry Rainey. Wow. It was all I could say. Unlike the first name Jen had mentioned, Jerry was someone I knew fairly well, I reasoned, but apparently I was mistaken. He was my quota in the chemistry class where I met Jen. Go on, Zali said in a low, steady voice. I absolutely despise you. Jen listed her. Jen took a moment to recover her composure. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she gazed at the ceiling, wiping them away with a deep breath. She began speaking to me without looking at me. You knew about my past. I was pretty open about what I did at school, but you remained consistent. I dated a lot, but I still saw you quite frequently, a few times each month. Yeah, about that. I responded when I realized she was asking me. It's clever to make this a dialogue rather than a confession. It would reduce the impact if I agreed on even basic story points. So, she continued, boys came and went. I experimented freely, but there was no one who made me want to stop. I must have flinched as she looked at me. Sorry, but you already knew I wanted to date rather than settle down. Even after you settle down, it appears that nothing has changed. I couldn't help it. My cheeks felt moisturized. Carl, Zali reprimanded me gently. No, Jen replied. It is true. I'm very sorry. I could feel my teeth grinding at the feeble apology. Another location while the boys came and went. But you stayed. You were not perfect. But you were. You drew on me, demonstrating that it was more than just getting into my pants. You were real. You were a man. She looked at me with wet red eyes. Her hand started to reach for mine, but she pulled back. 
I had no idea or cared if it was her choice of the expression on my face that prompted her to do so. You were. You are a man, and a good one in many ways. Anyway, we were about to graduate, and you proposed. I was extremely happy. I knew we had a lot to look forward to, and you were sincere about my happiness. I dated enough guys to know that almost all of them were selfish and would continue to be so for years. You were willing and able to commit to me. That was such a thrill. My parents adored you, and you were well prepared for a successful career. I could see us spending the rest of our lives together and getting things started right away. So the night of the engagement party, we went out to celebrate at the club. The place was packed, since we were approaching graduation. All of our friends were present. Jerry was there with them. Obviously, the drinks were flowing. I remember having a good buzz all night, just enough to keep my spirits up, but not enough to push me over the edge. I was on cloud nine. I was led out to the dance floor where it was just bodies grinding and sweating. I was so happy, horny, and worked up. Jerry eventually sat next to me, and when he leaned in to congratulate me, I simply kissed him. Just a peck. Really. The song changed, and then he appeared behind me. I recall feeling his arms around me, but not really holding me as I felt and grind against him. I turned back to face him, and he just grinned. When I turned back, he ground into me even more on the floor. I mean, I wasn't thinking with my head, but God, I was horned up. I glanced over to you at the table we were sitting at and you were holding court. You were filled with pride and happiness. I approached you and tried to get you to leave. I desperately needed to have sex. You simply asked if we had to leave at the exact moment when everyone was having a good time. Nonetheless, I was quite insistent. You finally agree that we will leave, but you requested a few more minutes. I noticed Jerry looking around. I assumed he was looking for me, so I went to the restroom to hide and then attempted to relax. I went to the ladies' room. Fortunately, the line was not too long, but I needed to splash my face regardless. I needed to cool off. I got in there and dabbed the water off my face, thinking I'd finally gotten that momentary horniness out of my system. He did a number on you. A voice came from next to me. I looked up and saw her. Jen nodded to Sally. I was lost. It was you, right? Jen asked the interrogator. Despite the tears, her face remained hard and bitter. You were the person next to me. I'll never forget a woman who looked like you. Sally just smiled. She was considerably younger. Obviously, Jen remained with me, but it was her. She was so attractive. I remember it like it was yesterday. A simple peasant dress accentuated her curves. The dark hair hung loosely, but the curls and waves. Her voice was a smoky, seductive purr, and with an accent. Oh, God. Even in that stinking club toilet, her perfume drove me insane. I couldn't remember seeing her before or where I knew her from. Seriously, how could I have forgotten someone who looked like her? But when she spoke, I felt as if I could completely trust her, as if I had known her all my life. She said the guy on the dance floor is really into you. You could feel it, right? I told her I had just gotten engaged and we were all out celebrating. I held up my engagement ring. She replied, I don't hear you saying no either. There was simply no way. I didn't know Jerry well, but I knew you knew him, which should have been enough. I wanted to mature and take things more seriously, but she just kept going. You could feel how hard he worked for you. You still wield that kind of power over men, but it won't last forever. Oh, I was so confused here. I was trying to start a whole life with you and become a responsible adult, but each word she whispered made me terrified. I was afraid I wouldn't be able to be happy with just one guy. I was afraid I wouldn't be enough for you. I was afraid I wouldn't be beautiful enough for men to want me anymore. I looked in the mirror and saw her smiling back at me. That look boosted my confidence. I knew what to do. I left the bathroom and returned to the table. My mind was on fire. I stood there as you told a story. You had clearly forgotten that I wanted to leave. I was so mad at myself. I left and went to find Jerry on the other side of the bar. He smirked as if he knew exactly what I wanted. I guess it was obvious. We left silently through the back door. We hadn't even closed the door yet when we got started. It was back alley sex and Jerry was terrible, but it felt incredible. I'd never felt anything like that before. He didn't have to be good. And that little creep could handle it. Barely. But that was sufficient. I was forewarned and Jen's retelling was factual rather than titillating. She didn't enjoy telling me about it, but I was furious and perplexed. 
I was experiencing a wide range of uncomfortable emotions. I was furious with Jen. I was furious at Sally for instigating this. I was furious at Jerry for his careless friendship. My mouth was dry, but I had to ask, was that it? You know the answer. Jen's head was down. I mean with Jerry. No. She sighed before taking a deep breath. He called, said it was ready for you, and I went to see him. She began sobbing again. I made sure you didn't know and that you were busy. I never stay long and I never say anything to him. He tried to trash talk you once and I stood up and left. I should have stayed away. She shakes her head. I just needed to scratch that itch. Just for a short while. After the first few times, I felt as if whatever spill he had on me was broken. As I previously stated, he was terrible in bed. They essentially used him as a human sex toy. Then one day he relocated. He was gone. And that was it. It was a clean break. And I returned to you with the intention of starting over. Together. I never heard from him again and never looked back. My face was in my palms. The rage inside me was immense. I wasn't sure what to do. So I thought about Angie, my lovely daughter, so intelligent and clever. She was truly the best of both of us. What has happened to her? How would she handle the fallout from the terrible revelations? Could we stay as a family? The worst was yet to come, that I was aware of my belief in Angie. I didn't want to give up hope. What was it? Why, Jerry? I asked, barely above a whisper. Inspire me. It was only sex. Bullshit. She nodded and paused to gather her thoughts. This meant she was about to trot out. It was only sex. I appreciate the time she took. Despite her misery, she still looked beautiful to me. Control. She began with a stutter in her voice. He meant nothing to me. This does not make me feel any better. I spit. She flinched, realizing it was a cheap shot at an overused cliche. Yes, I understand. But it wasn't about Jerry. I mean, there was a naughty side to being co-workers, but you weren't buddies. But I could literally go to Jerry and not say anything. I didn't want to speak to him, hear his voice, kiss him. Sometimes I'd put a pillow over his head to avoid being reminded of what I was doing. I had complete control because he was only a sex toy. So you're a size queen, I've never satisfied you. No, no. She bounced and waved her hands to emphasize her speech. Not at all. You have got to believe me. I simply stared at her. Do you believe her? Was she out of her mind? That was the last thing I was planning to do. She was taken aback when she realized what I had meant. I mean, I have had some big eyes. Jerry was one of them. I had total control over him. That turned me on. And he felt like a toy in my hands. And I used to direct all of the action and tell him what to do. You're exactly right in your mind. We make love even when we are simply going through the motions. There is more passion and touching you than any Jerry's in the world. He never had anything on you. She looked down at her hands and sniffled. I was vulnerable and we adjusted. Her head snapped up, glaring at our visitor. And that woman did not help. Sally extended her hands in an appeasing gesture. Regardless of what she has done so far, I cannot force you to make decisions. I appreciated that she did not provoke Jane any further. I was confused and nervous, and there was this strange man. I assumed I would always wonder if I did not try. This is not an excuse. I have no excuses. I am aware of this. But this is the truth, and it's a mistake I made and must live with. But I went to our wedding completely committed to you. And once I became pregnant with Angie... I dedicated myself to being the best mother I could be to her and wife to you. You may recall that I had only recently started teaching and was already being considered for promotion within the department. This was all earned. I was busting my buttocks to get that. But once we got pregnant, I dropped it. I owed you, whether you realized it or not. I knew you'd make an excellent father, and I was going to make sure you got it. Being this defensive was a new experience in our relationship. Maybe this was a good thing. It just sucked that the cost of bringing it out was so expensive. Your guilt over Jerry led you to Angie. No, perhaps not the pregnancy. No, absolutely not. However, my decision to leave teaching and raise her at home may have been influenced by a desire to ensure that our daughter never went hungry. I understood how important that was to you. I see. So I did. It didn't mean I forgave her, but there were some aspects of her story that I could hold on to. And that was the beginning. I had spent decades imagining myself in Jen's shoes and seeing things from her perspective. 
and this was gin logic at its best. I need a drink, I grumbled as I rose from the couch. Somehow I knew we were only getting started. The other two remained in their positions but kept a wary eye on each other. Jen's tension was evident in the way she held herself and alternated between sobbing at her hands and staring daggers at Sally. I considered getting a few fingers of scotch in a tumbler, but instead went for a large glass of water. God knew my brain was already foggy, and I needed to think beyond grunts and monosyllables. I brought small glasses for the ladies. Shall we proceed? I asked, sitting down and staring at the gin. Who the hell is Randall Hicks? She exhaled. There is no rest for the wicked. She began by rolling her eyes up to the ceiling. Angie had started nursery school and was leaving the house for a few hours. You may recall that I was at the top of Angie's weight gain chart during my pregnancy. I must have gained 50 pounds. By the time Angie was heading to school, I'd lost about 30 of it, but the last 20 or so were driving me insane. I'm not sure how much you remember me being angry and on edge. I nodded. This was true. Jen had always been vain and proud of her physique and overall fitness. She wasn't crazy about it. Under normal circumstances, she would probably weigh around 140 pounds, but her mother was obese, which caused a number of health problems. Jen swore it would never be her. So while she was still weighing between 155 and 160 pounds, she had numerous conversations with herself in front of the mirror following the pregnancy. And I did remember the gym. Did you have a trainer? Wasn't it a woman? She nodded. Yes, Johnny. She was very good. I liked. I am sure it was fantastic, I snapped. Can we skip to the part about you cheating? 304. Jane winced, and a new bout of crying began. Even Sally reacted. Carl, confessing is not an easy task. We are here to see if we can save your lives together. I looked at Zoe. She wasn't at the top of my friend list at the time. In fact, I believe that the entire event should have remained buried. And her digging up things that should have been left alone was extremely unwelcome. I didn't try to hide my contempt, but she didn't flinch, despite the fact that I was almost as tall as her while sitting. That was no small accomplishment. Thank you, Carl. Zali reached over and touched my arm. Her touch was warm, soothing, and extremely welcome. I was reminded of what appeared to be generous curves beneath her loose clothing. I could see how she was probably stunningly beautiful a few decades ago. I waved my hand contemptuously. Jen paused before continuing. All right. The majority of my free time was spent when Angie was at school, which was only a few hours during the day. The gym crowd at the time consisted primarily of housewives and trainers working out on their own. That may sound like a relaxing environment until you consider how many trophy wives approach fitness. It can be like a spandex fashion show with the amount of flesh displayed resembling an 80s B-movie. I didn't really think about it, though. I only wanted to get in and out. Joni was suitable for that. We worked and worked, but the last few pounds just wouldn't leave, regardless of what we did. So I noticed a guy there performing a different routine, one that appeared to be very advanced. And she introduced me to Randall. She came to a halt, her hands twisting into knots. Do I need to go through this? Jen pleaded, looking at me and then at her accuser. Look, I reasoned, get it out. There will be no trickle truthing this out. Get it done. Believe me, I'm not happy to hear about you either. I stopped myself before insulting her again. It did not work. She burst into tears again. Rise and plead with me. I was pissed off at her. No, I was already enraged and on the verge of bursting out. She admitted to cheating on me for, well, forever. If I counted all the other guys she had slept with before we became a closed relationship and then continued to cheat on me afterward. However, telling this to my face proved difficult for her. What sort of crazy world is this? We hadn't even begun to discuss her accepting responsibility for her actions. This was simply a recounting of her actions, which she is incapable of performing. Throughout our lives together, I let her take charge of certain responsibilities. Unspoken with that power was the implied responsibility to take charge of everything. I took care of the yard work, so if a lawnmower broke, I fixed it myself. Jen oversaw the household finances, which included balancing the checkbook and dealing with the account. Here she was trying to avoid her responsibilities. She needed to discuss her affairs. I wasn't going to let that go. I believe she could see that she had pushed me to my limits. She looked at her lap and spoke quietly and quickly. 
I asked Randall for assistance when I wasn't working with Johnny. He was nice and willing to give me his time. Here we go, I muttered. No, it was not like that. It was not. She protested, staring at me. I simply glared at her. No, not at first. I snorted derisively. It was as if she forgot. I already knew the ending to that story. I had to wonder if all cheaters believed that everyone else was dumber than them. I am not dumb. Not by a long shot. I responded to the unspoken accusation. Zombie began to gesture, allowing Jane to continue. But I was going to get it out. What I am guilty of is loving my wife above all else and trusting her not to hurt us. This is how I'm repaid. Not only was there infidelity, but there was also the audacity to treat me as if I were stupid. Please, Carl, Sally soothed. Let her finish. I understand that this will be difficult for both of you. But I promise that you will have options. And I was back at it again. Who was this woman to make such pronouncements as if they were all part of her job? that the revelations would not devastate her family. The prickly heat in my ears reminded me that I needed to control my temper. I closed my eyes and started counting to myself as Jen sobbed. After a brief pause, she resumed speaking. Randall was a gentleman not much taller than me with a slim build. Attractive, but not necessarily conventionally handsome. Not massive by any means, but very distinct in shape. He was careful not to be overly flirtatious or touch me inappropriately. Some white spotting occurred when he guided me with careful hands, but he was always polite and appropriate for a trainer. Then how did bitches? She spit the word out. She nodded at Sally again. Sally remained silent during the accusation, a sly grin on her full lips. With Randall's help, I lost the rest of my weight. He was very good at it and motivating, not just a drill sergeant. The results were not unnoticed. Some of the gym bunnies started asking how Randall helped me lose the last few pounds. The implications were quite clear. You can imagine the type of rumors they would spread. Some even claimed to have taken him for a test drive, and it was no surprise that he was so effective given that he was the only piece of aerobic exercise equipment. I was not about to engage with them. I was polite about it. But confronting the bimbos was not a battle I was willing to fight. Still, I couldn't get their words out of my mind. His body was rock solid, and he was a sex god. He was not my type. Really and you took good care of me at home. I was not going without. I tried to increase my efforts on you. There were a few days when I don't think you even got to go upstairs after work before being attacked. Jan mentioned specific times that seemed familiar. We, like all couples, experienced periods of increased sexual activity. However, every couple experiences similar cycles, times of increased and decreased activity. This time, she was more aggressive and preferred less demanding sex. I was only too happy to comply. It had passed just like the rest of the cycles. It was mildly noticeable, but these cycles had occurred frequently enough that I had not looked the proverbial gift horse in the mouth and questioned why or why not. But this comment triggered the nagging voice in the back of my mind, asking about the other times our sex life picked up. Were these from previous affairs she was having? I may never know. Randall made a tentative pass but it was ineffective and easily shot down. I did it kindly. I mean, I enjoyed the gym and wanted to stay. I also did not want to get him into trouble. He did not commit a crime. It made me feel good to some degree. Then you were sent overseas on a product transfer junket, and I have no excuse. I tried to get enough of you before you left, but not the following day. I went to work out and found her at the gym, working with Randall. She pointed at Zoe and the two of them were so close that seeing her again made my jaw drop. She was still alive after several years. Jennifer shivered. I knew they were looking at me together. I could see everything laid out in front of me. I should have turned around and walked away, but when they looked side by side, they weren't wearing anything more revealing than anyone else in the gym. They simply used their sexuality. I remember scanning the gym to see if anyone else was staring, but it was business as usual. They brought their heads together and whispered to each other as they signed me up, as if I were a meal. There was intimacy and familiarity. I knew they were sleeping together, and that triggered a whole flood of emotions. Why? I don't have a clue. It shouldn't have affected me in the slightest. I had barely any interest in Randall, or so I thought. And her? She was gorgeous, but nothing more than a stranger. But the idea of them together, the dusky sex pot and the Energizer bunny, and they did the worst thing possible. They left me alone. I exercised on my own.
Other than a nodding acknowledgement from both of them, they spoke with each other while I sweated and worked. But I couldn't work hard enough to get the mental pictures out of my head of them. All my senses were stimulated in the mental images I had cooked up in my mind. Anything was possible. I couldn't explain the hold that they had over me. It was primal. Just the idea of hot, highly sexual people getting it on. I didn't know that could be so hot. But for some reason, those two, I just lost it. It was embarrassing, but I did my best to walk out. I called you later at your hotel, telling you how much I missed you already. Here. She paused. Her own excitement came through in her description. I didn't realize that I needed a break as well. I rose from the seat to get more water for all of us on the way into the kitchen. I passed the table and noticed the food still steaming. Funny. I would have thought it had long cooled by now while I filled three glasses from the water bottle. I just looked out at the backyard at my garden. So peaceful, green and idyllic. I wanted to be out there now, forgetting about everything that had happened this evening. Hell, why was this happening? Once I retuned, Jin drank greedily. Zali thanked me for hers. I asked her again if she wanted to sit. She politely refused and told me that this was the way to do this. The fine lines at the corners of her mouth and I showed she was pleased with how things were going. Far be it from me to understand women at all. Soon continued her story. I thought I had it out of my system. You know I like to be in control. But two days later, the same thing happened. It started when I walked in with that plastic blonde Bitsy Myers coming up to me in the locker room and asked if I'd be interested in some playtime at her place. I was now the talk of the bimbo crew. I was mortified. She just smirked, letting me know the offer was always open. I was beginning to worry about my own lack of control. Sally and Randall were off doing their own thing, but the looks they gave me would have melted the plastic out of his face. I could barely make it through my circuit before I was back in the bathroom stalls. I made my way out to the parking lot and she was there. The hair, the eyes, the lips. I was lost, but when she leaned in and whispered, Randall has a slot he'd like to fill. Do you have time? I was suddenly ready for more. My wife looked at me. Her eyes were all rimmed red. Her hair was half in, half out of her ponytail. She looked small, lost again. I had to remind myself not to offer her comfort while she was confessing her infidelity to me. I loved her so much, but I hurt. And I had no idea where we would be when this was all done. I wish I had fought harder. I thought of you honestly and Angie. I thought how much I loved you, but I couldn't say no. She stopped again. I offered her the last of my water. Please continue. Jennifer, Zali prompted softly and not unkindly. I absolutely despise you. Zali just nodded. She began again. Forget the myth. He wasn't simple. We went to his place, which was a small studio apartment nearby the gym. He was a bit submissive and really into pleasing me, which was good. I was already tired, and I just didn't want to be reminded of being such a three or four. It was kind of the same setup, like with Jerry. I just put a pillow over my own head and let him do this thing. You know, wind up the Energizer Bunny and let him go, go, go. Finally, I was done. I could barely move, but I think I ran to my car. I picked up Angie from class. The sour look on the teaching aide's face told me she had a damn good idea what I had been up to with my free time. Just another added dose of humiliation for my debasement. I just spent the rest of the day trying to recover. With Randall, there was no love. There was no feeling at all. It was all stimulation. He was a machine. It was all push the button, get a climax and I just kept pushing the button. Jim's face was distant and a bit wistful, as if she were remembering a story that happened to someone else. Maybe she was. So you didn't love him? Oh, God. No, no, not in the slightest. She shook her head vigorously. I love that gesture, but in this case, I understood its significance. But you went back. Yes, I did. I enjoyed it, but there was no emotional connection. The guy was like a sex guru. I wasn't sure if he really enjoyed it. Servicing women was, it was as if it was his purpose. A job like a jackhammer. And after you returned from your project, I believe I saw Randall twice more. I knew he was seeing other women at the gym. He has certainly earned his reputation. But when I went to end it with him, he said he was afraid. He had overstayed his welcome and was considering leaving town. I had the impression there was more to it. But by then, the novelty had worn off. 
and I felt like shit for going behind her back again. It was not a problem to leave him behind. I quit the gym and didn't see him again. I was as guilty as sin and attempted to manipulate my way back into your forgiveness. You handled everything with your usual good humor, and for the past 15 years, you've been my everything. She offered me a weak smile. I did not return it. She leaned back, exhausted as bad as she appeared. I bet I felt worse. These confessions were a struggle. So, I asked the room, is this it? Zombie was about to speak when Jim cut her off. Don't! Don't say that! Sally looked surprised, but smiled. Jen turned to face me. No, I did my best for 14 years. 14 years of guilt and shame. I put all of that behind me, and it was the wife you deserved. I was the best mother I could be to Angie. There was no one. That's enough games, Jennifer. No honey, no deer, and no affection. Just a bone-tired resignation to get this over with. Please, let us just get this done. Donnelly, Ferguson, the missing child? I asked incredulously. She nodded. God damn it. Donnie Ferguson had graduated from high school the previous year and was scheduled to attend one of the major universities in the East. But a week before he was supposed to leave for orientation, he vanished. His car was still in the driveway, and his closet was still full of clothes. No, not a word from him. Perhaps he had money on him, but there had been no withdrawals, over $50 from the previous month. He hadn't been saving money for a planned escape. His story was widely circulated for several weeks. His supporters were on the news, pleading for any information. There were billboards up. Fundraising events were held across the country to raise awareness and pay for private investigators. All for naught. Donnie's parents were real taskmasters. I've always encouraged him to go above and beyond. Tough parents. By all accounts, he was a good child. Smart, but somewhat quiet. I could identify with that type of kid. Aside from that, he was one of those sensitive people who loved nature. His journals, which he left behind, expressed his desire to travel the world and commune with nature. That type of stuff. However, the world continued without any signs from Donnie. After a while, other tragedies took the spotlight, and Donnie's story faded a little more. I heard rumors that he'd had enough of his home life's stress and had left to pursue his own personal dreams. Of course, some people said he joined the French Foreign Legion, while others claimed he was abducted by aliens and butt-probed. The point was, no one was certain I had Donnie in his junior year of AP history. He was a very bright child, perhaps a little dreamy, but he was sweet. It was a little too pretty for a man, but he looked great in it. Before you say anything, let me clarify that I did nothing inappropriate with him back then. Who is she kidding again? I knew how the story ended. She has already admitted that she screwed the little brat. She could read my expression. Please listen. I collaborate with that class and one of my senior political science classes to create a model United Nations. The team would travel to New York. Donnie was in that group. His parents had money and wanted him to do the extracurricular for his college application. They came to see me a few times after school and on P-Day to ensure Donnie was fulfilling his potential. I hate helicopter parents, but Donnie's were the textbook example, only ball breakers. I can only imagine how it was for him. Anyway, we traveled to New York. I was one of the official school escorts along with other parent chaperones. I stiffened. Those trips happened every few years, and Jen always put a lot of effort into each one. Given how much preparation she had done ahead of time, the actual trip seemed like an afterthought. Time spent with the students discussing logistics and individual responsibilities. Was that where she and he bonded? When did she first have sex with him? I felt like puking. Nothing happened during his first visit that evening. Jen touched my hand. I didn't jump as expected. I didn't collapse either. I struggled to maintain eye contact with her, but I felt compelled to. Not like that anyway. What happened was that after class dinner in Manhattan, we discussed him. Kid stuff. Like the pressure he felt from his parents and the uncertainty of going to school. He wanted to attend school as far away from home as he could. He knew his parents were unreasonable, and he knew he'd always be under their thumb if he was around the poor kid. He simply needed someone to vent to, to tell him that these years and his parents would not define his life. He needed to know that hope and freedom awaited him. Of course, I couldn't make any promises to him, but I did tell him that there was always the option to start over, and no one would know what you had done before. It's a new beginning. He thanked me, and that was all.
Any contact we had for the remainder of the trip was related to a UN visit or our return trip home. We completed the trip and rode for the remainder of the year. He performed well in the class. I believe he got an A for the entire course. We didn't talk much after that, but I did catch him looking at me in class every now and then. He said something like, thank you for listening. I got the impression he didn't have many receptive ears among his parents, family, and friends. They were all preoccupied with their own lives and problems, or their plans for him. Nobody seemed to care about him. My senior year, I didn't have Donnie. I'd walk past him in the halls among hundreds of other students, and every now and then there was that casual recognition. But that was it. A chaperone for the senior prom. That's where it started. I forgot what I was doing, but early in the evening, Donnie approached me and introduced me to his date. As they approached, the crowd began to thin out, and I noticed her. Jen's eyes blazed with a rare fury that she kept for when she didn't get her way. He said, Mrs. Reinhardt, Zoe is my date. She's an exchange student from Belize who has been staying with my family. Naturally, I was aware of her identity. Jen paused and looked at Zoe. I finally realized that glare contained more than just anger. There was fear. My wife was genuinely concerned about this woman turning to me. Jen's eyes were saucers. I could see white all around Iris. You do not understand. That was her. But it was her from 15 years prior. From the gym with Randall. From the bar with Jerry. She was young and incredibly beautiful. But it couldn't have been her. She had not aged. I wanted to run away, screaming. Not only couldn't she be there, but if she was, I knew what would happen and I couldn't let it happen. But I was frozen. Everyone was focused on Donnie and his date. That year's graduating class included some lovely girls, real beautiful things. But it's her. She outperformed them all, just walked in. Her dress was a vibrant green wrap that fell above her knees. It appeared to be made of banana leaves. The dress left very little to the imagination. Sandals wrapped around her calves and tied below her knees. Her face was accentuated with just enough makeup to highlight her stunning, dark, and smoky complexion. Her hair hung down. It was banded with what I thought were 24 karat gold ringlets, similar to those on her necklace and bracelets. I'm guessing she had about $100,000 worth of gold jewelry. You do not understand, Carl. She resembled a goddess. Zoe's smile was quick and genuine as she realized the price. And there she was, on the arm of sweet and lost Donnie Ferguson, just staring at me. There was no way either of us was getting out of there, and everyone else was just staring at us and her. I can't remember what was said, but I must have thanked Donnie for the introduction and introduced myself. Donnie, you're 18, correct? He nodded. How old is Sally? She started talking, but the background noise was loud enough that I had to lean in. I did it instinctively, but before long her lips were at my ear, and I caught a whiff of her scent. It was sex. Sex on top of something dry and dark, decaying wood and something even worse beneath it. I could barely resist her there, but she whispered in that tone. Donnie tells me how kind you were to him and how you helped him when he needed it. He liked to repay you in any way you wanted. And I drew back, unable to resist her knowing smile, which featured perfectly aligned teeth across dark, lush lips. Nobody could. I smiled. I believe I smiled. But I excused myself and went to the restroom to splash water on my face again, with only a few words. She had planted the seed in my mind, and there was only one way to satisfy it. I'm not sure why I even tried to resist. I mean, after Jerry and Randall didn't, I'd already learned my lesson. The evening passed, and Donnie and his date moved as if they were inside a bubble. People simply parted and stared as they approached. I recognized the feeling, but out of all those people, she chose me. It gave me a rush to know I was the one. It was amazing. At some point, I gave Donnie my number. He knew, too. I had never had a desire for that kid until she planted the seed. I'm not sure why he chose me, or if it was his choice. Perhaps she was involved all along. Despite having the most beautiful girl who had ever attended a school prom on his arm, Donnie continued to look for me. Nobody else noticed. She just danced with him and laughed, knowing she had cast a spell and that everyone was watching her. The prom ended, and the kids went their separate ways. I returned home and attempted to screw you through the mattress in bed. Spring. I needed to do something, anything, to prevent that horrible witch's spell from working. I might as well have tried to block out the sun. 
By the time the senior class graduation exercises were completed, I was jumping at shadows. Every time my phone rang, I dreaded seeing who it was. When Donnie finally called, I cried for an hour, but I felt compelled. We met at a coffee shop two towns away. It was impossible for us to be seen together. He was almost apologetic, but there was a magnetic pull between us that I couldn't resist. I gave in and went to a motel. He was young, beautiful, and very inexperienced. I had to teach him how to please a woman. He compensated for it with the sweet attention of youth, with all of a woman's body and gratitude. He lacked stamina at first, but he quickly recovered. I cringed at the mental images. We met about half a dozen times over the next two months, and while the sex wasn't great, it was sweet and reminded me of us from many years ago. An innocence I had long forgotten. Yes, it was. I'm not sure what I'm trying to say or justify, but it was an opportunity for me to remember while also giving this kid hope that he was finally about to escape his parents. My guilt and shame overwhelmed this attraction I had, and then one day it was all over. I called Donnie, and while he was sad, I believe he knew it was over too. He was such a sweet kid. My anger flared up again. Yes, a sweet kid is sleeping with someone else's wife. But he was thankful and understanding. It was a simple separation. I felt nothing for him other than goodwill and the desire for a young child to be free of the pressures he faced. And I returned to you, angry and saddened that I had once again failed you. I hope you continue our life together. And I was worried that I hadn't developed enough self-control. I ask a lot of you. I know I do. But I do not hold myself to the same standard. Jen's face was in her hands as she sobbed. I knew she'd been truthful honest to the point of pain, honest to the point of ending our marriage. She was tired and had nothing left. Sally moved forward and gently placed her strong hands on Jen. Jen's energy level skyrocketed. How did you do that? How did you get me to do that? How did you stay so young and attractive? Jennifer began. We have our roles to play. I did not and cannot force you to do something you do not want to do. I can only make suggestions at any time. Did you say no when we spoke? If you did, I believe that your self-control would have been much stronger. As for my appearance, I've always been able to fit into situations similar to today. She twirled her hands at herself, revealing her comfortable, middle-aged appearance. This meets my needs for today. So that's it? I asked. Jen was crying into her hand again. I was pissed off. I was trying to process everything that had happened and felt a little bad about the bargain I made with Sally. That changed when Sally's eyes flashed at me for a moment. She pursed her lips. Carl, could you please prepare two bowls of that wonderful food for Jennifer and me? We were about to eat. I shook my head, and Rose went to the kitchen. Sally was speaking quietly to Jen as I ladled out the still-steaming risotto. The earthy smells were both soothing and symbolic of Sally's strength. I brought the two bowls into the living room and gave them to the ladies. Carl, if you don't mind, you haven't received any yet. I did mind. I had had a difficult evening, and despite my intense emotions, I was hungry. But I did not complain. Sally took her dish and began Jennifer Reinhardt. I've heard your confession. You sinned against your husband by sleeping with three men outside of your body. I'd like to offer you the opportunity to atone for your sins and put them behind you. If the first half of the evening wasn't weird enough, this was insane. What the hell? Jen echoed my own thoughts. I am, as always, uttering my true name for the third time in my living room. It was a powerful yet compassionate word. The ripple of energy in the attendance rank. The rotten odor that followed made me happy. I did not have a dish in my hand. I am a two-faced person in that I both create and remove sin from you. I can completely remove your sins with this ritual. Remove them from your soul. Make it as if they never happened. You won't remember them, it will be as if nothing happened. Will you accept this gift? I believe our stunned silence was noted. I'm sure Jen's thoughts were that this was an opportunity to rid herself of the guilt and shame she had felt since Jerry, a chance to be the woman she believed she had always been. I was slightly more cautious. I despised what she had done. I hated it. But it was also a part of her, as I considered it. Jen remained under control thanks to her guilt, I wondered if she would have been more difficult to live with had she been Little Miss Perfect. I'll admit it was a little selfish of me, but again, Jen had cornered her own segment of the selfish market.
Can I continue to live with her despite her outright confessions? To be honest, I didn't think I could live with her knowing that. I was afraid of what my next steps would be. Really? Jen's tears had stopped, and for the first time this evening, her face was bright and hopeful. It made her appear several years, if not decades, younger. You can make it as if it never happened. Sally nodded with a small smile on the corner of her mouth. I am a sin eater. I would consume the marks on your soul. In time, I'll be able to use the sin to benefit others. I can give them the same confession and absolution. This is who I am, Jen. I said this while placing my hand on her leg. Please, there is always a price. She turned. She was very hopeful. So beautiful. But honey, this is an opportunity to correct my mistakes, to erase the negative impressions I've left on you. Against us? You know I would do anything to be the person you deserve. You've always worked hard and been there for Angie and me. I exhaled and shook my head. Jen was willful. It was one of my favorite things about her. I nodded, but I wasn't satisfied. I accept Zali's offer. Zali smiled warmly and genuinely. The ritual involved both of them taking a spoonful of risotto. Jen was told to say the name of one of her lovers. Zali took her own spoonful and repeated the name. Then they were both woody. This was to be repeated for every one of her sins. You'll feel the same way afterward, but your memories of those events will fade and you'll soon have no recollection. Each event will be as if you declined and went on with your life. Time will heal itself around those events and your soul will be cleansed. It will take some time, but by the new moon, you will be rid of them. They performed a ritual, and as Jen said each name, I swear a black wisp of smoke emitted from her mouth and drifted to our guest who absorbed it. By the end, Jen was crying again, but these were tears of relief and joy. She held me and sobbed. I felt pretty much the same as before. My memories were in turmoil, threatening my very soul. I wasn't very happy. What did this mean for me? Could I just forgive her for confessing? And if these events never happened, could I forget about them? My wife carried the potential to cheat on me within her. Could I just ignore that? As a result, it vanished, leaving no trace. However, I still had a memory. It's as if I had a fantasy about my wife cheating on me. But it was just words on a page. It was all in my mind. What if I don't want to forget? Jen got up from the couch and started dancing around the room. She swung around to hug Zali, giving her an affectionate kiss on the cheek. Even Zali appeared shocked and amused. She continued to celebrate her singing by dancing, hooting, and laughing. Oh my God, such a relief, she cried. I was afraid I'd lose everything. This is going to be so awesome. She continued to bounce around until she realized I was still sitting. What's wrong, honey? Jen, there is always a price, but it's for our own good. She was perplexed that I wasn't pleased, that she had essentially received a free pass for cheating on me several times. A get-out-of-sin-free card. Jen, you cheated on me. Not anymore, she sang. But you did it. You were given the opportunity to cheat on me and never said no. This does not change the situation. What happens in the future? Would you be able to refuse a man who wants you? You are still a beautiful woman. Men want you. And this does not change that. I can't always watch over you. I will not do it. Her brows furrowed, and her cheerful demeanor faded slightly. Jen was always intelligent. However, she had not anticipated how guilt shaped and formed you into the woman you are today. You're a good woman who will listen to me. Not very often, but whenever I needed you to listen, I'm afraid of what else. This will affect you. I'm glad you're happy. Really? But whether you realize it or not, Cheating has always been important to us. It produced numerous positive outcomes. Jen appeared puzzled. Zali had waited patiently. Jen smiled and extended her hand. It's been good to see you again, Sally, but I need to talk to my husband. I've got a lot to make up for. Zali's smile improved significantly. Her eyes conveyed the change. They were incredibly expressive. Jennifer, I'm glad you found relief from your sins. But that was not my main reason for coming tonight. This visit was not about you at least at first. Wait, what? But it was time for Zali to act again, as she spoke the words. Oh, my head. My name is Carl Reinhardt. With a puff of rotten wind and ripples of energy passing through the room, she named herself a ball. My fists! You have sinned against your fellow man and you must confess to make amends. I call you murderer! 
Jen fell to the ground. I went and picked her up, placing her near the couch. I'd always been strong. It was easy for me to move her because she was very strong. Honey, what did you do? Jen's voice was a whisper and her eyes were wide and vacant. I'm curious how much of this will stick with her and how many times I'll have to remind her so she doesn't forget why. Exactly what I had done. Jen, I was aware of all your affairs. I was familiar with Jerry, Randall, and Donnie. I mean, I didn't know Randall and Donnie's names, but I knew you were screwing them. I know you think you're smart and clever, but you were very sloppy. It did not take long to follow you and learn about them. Jerry and Randall were scum, preying on women. I did what I needed to do, and society suffered no loss. In fact, what I did likely saved dozens of marriages and countless couples. Having to deal with those two assholes was heartbreaking. Donnie sounds like a nice kid, but he got too close. Randall hadn't seen you relapse like that in a long time. It just kills me inside. I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't take you disrespecting me anymore. Jen was horrified. I knew she wouldn't understand, but she whispered. But I couldn't help it. She did something to me. I shook my head gently. I did it for us, for Angie. Angie needed her mother. She didn't need the distraction or, heaven forbid, a broken hallway. There was no way I was not going to protect what I owned. I didn't mind what you thought of me, even if you thought I was a jerk you could walk all over. I would provide the stability and home we all needed and deserved. Honey, when I reached out to her, she jumped. I know this may come as a surprise, but consider how shocked I was that you'd abandoned me after everything we'd been through. I've always let you have control over our marriage in this house. I gave you that. I will gladly let you make your own decisions. I love you very much. I always have. But you were unable to control yourself, and I couldn't have it. So the serpents appeared in our garden. So I did what any man would do. I protected what I owned. I would never tolerate any threats against us or Angie. I stood up and walked to the sliding glass doors that opened onto the back garden. I opened it, letting the lovely evening garden air in. It was my haven. My patience for my family and for you is limitless. I never do anything to hurt you, but I will do everything in my power to protect you. I wish you had kept your confession to yourself, as knowing it hurt me. I believe I could have overcome it and moved forward with you by my side. Those sins were part of your imperfection. I believe it made you better, if that makes sense. You were flawless despite your flaws. I wish you had not chosen to absolve your sins. I believe they were a way for you to control yourself. Otherwise, you could have been much worse. The large tool, the sex expert, and the younger lover. You had them all, plus my own love. I couldn't see you wanting to leave our bed again. You tried all of those types and they lost their appeal after you sampled them. But they no longer exist. Will you stray again? You could. And I can't go through that loss of control again. It would mean the end for us. So yes, I removed all three after they took you out of my arms. They had little value as individuals. But once I dissolved them and spread them out in the garden, I believe they brought both of us much more joy. Really? I would have assumed you picked up on it when I slipped and called the lemon tree. Jerry several times. I laughed, and Jenny shuddered. I wondered if she vomited up the risotto. What sins will be returned to her? Perhaps that was too metaphysical a discussion for the moment. Jen croaked, You are a monster! I am what? You made me fall in love after watching you at university. Go from guy to guy, spying on Donnie, fumbling around and attempting to hit you in that flea bag motel. I am a family man and a father, and I am completely committed to you. Sally had remained silent almost the entire time. She seemed as fascinated as Jen. Carl Reinhardt, you confessed. Will you accept my gift of forgiveness for your sins? I sat and thought about it. I wasn't particularly sad about what I had done because I had done it for the right reasons. For love, for family. I thought about my garden and how well it had grown thanks to the three's contributions. The garden began as a way to get rid of Jerry and his large meat after I had preserved him in a barrel of quicklime. Would we even get it if Jin had cheated? This year's avocado harvest was particularly abundant. It would yield a good harvest. I thought about myself. This was one of the few times I had exercised control in our marriage. I had pride, and Jen had deeply wounded me. That shaped me just as much as it hurt. I'd moved past it and taken action. Did I want to just give up on those shaping events? Will I be the same man? I did not think so, 
and I doubt I'd be a better man, but mostly I thought of Jen. She was quick to try and forget. I understood why she decided to accept Sally's gift. Her ego was so rigid and dominant that she couldn't accept her flaws. Of course, that was silly. Even this was an imperfection. But if Jen's acceptance of the gift tipped the dominant scale in our relationship, I was afraid I'd be lost and consumed by her. All relationships strike a balance between good and bad, the given and the technology. We all have both good and bad qualities within us. When one is capable of great evil, the other responds with great goodness. Jen might argue this point with me as a devil's advocate. What's wrong with having two positive sides? Isn't that a good thing? Unfortunately, no. One person must be the disciplinarian. One person must have the will to say no. What could be better for a couple than wishing the best for their child? They want to protect their child. That could be a good thing, right? The best thing, no. When you have that, you get parents like poor Donnie's who hover over their child, filling him with their own worldly anxieties and eventually driving the poor kid away, leaving them to misplace blame and wonder why they raised a broken child when all they wanted was what was best for him. As a result, having an unbalanced couple with both on the good side can quickly become perverted and the opposite of what was intended. There must be a balance. So there we were, in such a secure relationship, and a newly purified jinn was now a force for good, threatening to destroy our marriage, and we were out of equilibrium. She needed to know and understand my capabilities as a counterbalance. She needed to remember that, and that's what I had to be to keep from being consumed. There was no doubt about it. I'd play this part for her, for us. Was I worried about Gin going to the police? Hardly. First, there were no bodies. There was no genetic material left to identify the bodies. I'm a chemist, after all, and an excellent one, if I may say so. All three have been reduced to ash and chemical components. There was no evidence that I had ever been near any of them, except Jerry. And that was 20 years ago. There was no evidence, only Jen's confession of infidelity. Sure, there was the thought that if she confessed, I'd kill her lovers. But Jen would have to admit her infidelity and that was my most reliable bargaining chip. Jen was cleansed, absolved. There was no more infidelity. By the time she went to the police, she had already begun to lose memory of it. What will be left? So, if there are no affairs, what would my motivation be? How could the cops make a case if there was no evidence or motive? Furthermore, even if she did retain her memories, I knew Jen could not admit to having multiple affairs. She was simply too proud to admit such flaws. It was a shame, honestly. I did not want the risotto to go to waste. After thanking Sally for her blessing, she departed that evening. I knew I'd see her once more. You see, women like Jen always try to maintain a moral high ground, even when they are covered in dirt. After Sally had left, she attempted to lecture me on how I could have asked Sally to erase my memories, and we could both have been cleansed and started over. That night, as I lay in bed thinking about everything that had happened, Jen had erased her memories of cheating. And in her mind, she is now the devoted and affectionate wife. In contrast, I was the devil, responsible for the deaths of innocent men. My situation was more complicated for me. I remember what she did. It was the root of my crime. After all, my sins were still present. My sins stemmed from my own lack of control over my marriage and Jen's choice to cheat on me. What happens if she is given the same decision again? Was Allie returning to inform me that my wife had sinned and Jen would be given another chance to atone for her crimes against my marriage? That was a burning question that kept me awake the entire night. I knew the answer. Six months later, my daughter Angie was visiting during her break, and I was in the garden picking avocados for salsa night. I'd already gathered all of the ingredients and placed them on the kitchen counter when Angie chimed in. I'll need tomatoes as well. I dashed back into the garden and made my way to the tomato bush. Thank you, Jen murmured, plucking the appropriate tomatoes. That night's salsa was delicious. Thank you for listening to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Also, leave a comment below to share your thoughts on what happened. Take care.